Welcome to the seventh meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. Uh, can I ask everyone in the room to ensure that their mobile phones are set to silent and ask people please not to record or photograph proceedings as we will do that for you. Uh, we will start today with agenda item one on subordinate legislation where, as colleagues will be aware, we have three instruments to consider. The first instrument is the Community Care Provision of Residential Accommodation Act with Scotland Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018. And the second instrument is the Community Care Provision of Residential Accommodation Act with Scotland Scotland Amendment Number 2 Regulations 2018. Uh, it is no coincidence that they have such similar names um, because, in fact, the first of those uh, is, uh, has been... Uh, there is no motion to annul either of these instruments, but on the first of those, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee made comment because of the drafting error in the regulations. The regulations are being introduced because of a change in legislation elsewhere, and unfortunately, in the uh, first instrument, the uh, date that has been put in is 24 hours too late, and therefore there would be a gap in provision. Uh, the DPLR committee pointed this out to the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government has therefore tabled the second instrument that I refer to in order to correct this error. Unfortunately, I think this is the second time in a very short number of weeks that we've had a drafting error of this kind in an instrument before us. Uh, I'm sure that point will be uh, uh, well understood by those responsible for drafting such instruments. But can I ask colleagues if they have any comments on either of these instruments before us. If not, uh, I would, do we therefore agree to make no recommendations on either of these instruments? That's very helpful. Thank you very much, colleague. That means that both instruments are now approved. The second one will immediately revoke the first, uh, and therefore the, that will be the one that will have effect. The third instrument is the functions of health boards and special health boards, Scotland, miscellaneous and Miscellaneous Amendments Order 2018. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has made no comments on this instrument. Uh, do any members have any comments on this instrument? If not, do the committee agree to make no recommendations on this instrument? Okay. Thank you very much. We now come to the second item on our agenda, which is uh, two evidence sessions on NHS corporate governance. And we start this morning with evidence from members of health boards. Can I welcome to the committee uh, our witnesses for this panel uh, and uh, introduce uh, Linda Dunyon, non-executive board member, NHS Tayside, Christine Lester, non-executive board member, NHS Grampian, and Dr. Graham Foster, uh, director of public health and strategic planning at NHS uh, Fourth Valley. Can I uh, invite colleagues to uh, ask questions? We're, I'm very grateful, I should say, in introduction to all of our, to all three witnesses, but also to the other NHS board members who very helpfully responded to our survey in recent weeks. And it is on that basis uh, that uh, we are very interested to hear directly from you, from your own different perspectives. And can I uh, start the questions uh, uh, with Jenny Gildreth? Um, I'd like to begin today by looking at board diversity um, and this is something that we considered in last week's evidence session. In the responses to our survey, 64% of board members were 55 or over and there was nobody in the 18 to 24 age bracket. And this is something that I raised last week in the context of this year being the year of uh, young people in Scotland. Um, and it wasn't just age, though, that was highlighted as a factor. Bill Scott from Inclusion Scotland said that there is also desperate underrepresentation of disabled people on all public boards, uh, including NHS boards. Do you think, then, we have an issue in terms of our representation at the moment? And can you perhaps talk us through how these positions are advertised in your local context? Is there something around the advertising of these positions that we maybe need to consider in greater detail? I'll start if that's okay. Um, I, I was actually um, appointed uh, through a process which was um, part of the alternative pilot whereby people were either appointed by being elected onto NHS boards or lay members of the public. And I was a lay member of the public, so I actually answered an advert that was in the Press and Journal. Um, so that's how I came to, to this role. Um, I would say I'm getting to the end of my, what, two, four-year terms now? 
it's only really been in the past three or four years that I have felt able to um, to be as well informed, I think, as I needed to be. I think um, from that perspective, I think if you want to get somebody on, and I've been doing, that's all I've been doing. You know, I haven't, um, I was widowed shortly before that. I was a carer for my husband. So that was, that. that's taken over my life. So um, it, there is so much um, to learn if you come at it as a lay person, I would say. I think the other thing, from an age perspective, I think the remuneration that's that's given to people, it doesn't allow you to do a full-time or even a part-time role. or it, It's not versatile enough for you to hold down another job at the same time. I suspect if you're on welfare benefits, that small salary would have a massive effect, impact on actually how you get your welfare benefits. So that... NHS Grampian is well represented from the disabled perspective, but not from the age perspective. Perhaps I could come yes. as well. Thank you. Um, I think that um, we need to be clear about why we want diverse boards. So I would take it back a step. I read the um, note of the evidence session of last week, and I have to say I was really quite concerned at some of what I was reading because it seemed to me that and I might be misinterpreting but it did seem to me that at points diversity was perhaps being seen as a, if not a substitute but perhaps a way of um, ensuring that certain voices are heard at the board table in a way that is representative now, that is counter to the Code of Conduct. We cannot represent anybody. This is an issue I've had to deal with at our own IJB. I chair Person Can Ross IJB. And it, I think, is a source of confusion which does actually need to be addressed. So I think we need to distinguish between having diverse boards, which I'm not arguing against, and putting in place effective mechanisms by which the huge variety of different perspectives can be brought to bear on the decision making, on the strategy, um, on the implementation of strategic direction by boards. So I think that there are two different things here. In terms of the way in which board positions are advertised, um, I think it's very misleading to suggest that you can actually be an effective non-executive member. I am also a lay member, have come through the public appointments um, process. You can't do it in eight hours. Nobody can do it in eight hours a week. So I think that's misleading. And in fact, um, in NHS Tayside, um, about three years ago, uh, we, there was a recruitment process. We did recruit a much needed female member of the board and she didn't last. And that was because she had come in with an expectation of committing eight hours. And when she couldn't do it, um, she just was very unhappy for quite a long period of time, felt like she was failing, which she was not. She was trying to do something that simply wasn't doable. So I think there is an issue there. I think for me, there's also an issue with um, the process by which people come to the board. Christine has talked about how long it takes to get to grips with the health board. When I joined Tayside, a, a, a chair elsewhere um, said to me, don't expect to know what you're talking about until you've been on the board for two years. And actually, that was really helpful advice. It made me feel a lot better. Um, it's something that everybody talks about. I think that there is a place for nurturing people, for being more creative about how we attract people to boards, but I do think we have a responsibility to ensure that below the board there are mechanisms in place whereby there is um, genuine engagement, participation and meaningful contribution to um, the business of the board. Thank you very much. Graham Foster. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's important to think about form follows function and what is the, the function of the different members of, of boards. Um, boards are made up of a variety of different individuals doing different roles. Um, for myself, I'm actually an executive director of a board, so it's a professional role. So um, like uh, the other executive directors on the board, we've trained for a very long time to get to that. So I would say it probably took 20 years of training to get me to the stage where I was appointed as a board member and I was able to sit on a board and take on what is 
I think, really a very important responsibility. Um, so for um, non-exec directors to come onto boards, um, it's important to think about what we're asking those non-exec directors to do. Um, I have the, the hugest respect um, for um, the non-execs that we have on our board. I see them working incredibly hard, um, getting to grips with really complex and difficult challenges uh, in a world which is often not one that they're used to. Um, traditionally, um, the role of a non-executive board member was very much about holding to account. Um, and I think if that is the role of a board member, then there is huge potential to have a very diverse board because it's about asking questions and asking difficult questions. So it might be about saying, why aren't you doing this for young people? And I, I know from experience with one of our local authorities that uses a young person's panel, it's hugely valuable because you get those questions. Um, equally, you know, are we representing the interests of, of various different groups in our community? Um, and the expertise there to be on our board and the willingness to stand up and ask those questions is really, really important for us. So that is hugely valuable. Um, what I see happening in recent years is the expectations on uh, board members and particularly non-executive board members have both increased and changed. Um, so I absolutely agree with what Linda said. I think anyone who thinks they're going to be a non-executive board member on a sort of part-time basis is probably kidding themselves now. Um, the uh, further emphasis that we've put onto community planning. So in our board, for example, we now have non-executive directors participating in community planning, which is a significant role. And we also have a huge expectation on fielding non-executive board members to take part in integration joint boards. Um, and those are quite different roles to the holding to account role that we've traditionally asked of non-execs. Um, and I'm not sure that we've had sufficient thought about what training and support uh, those individuals need to fulfil those roles. Um, I particularly see um, the work on integration joint boards as challenging because it's a very different environment. And an integration joint board is balanced uh, non-executive board members and local authority councillors and you'll be very aware that local authority councillors have a very different background experience and expectation um, of a structure and a process than a non-executive board member who might be a young person who signed up to do eight hours a week to, to um, provide some scrutiny of the board and, and ask difficult questions. So I think uh, diversity, um, to answer your original question, would be a really, really good thing. Um, but if we're going to land that and make it possible for non-executive board members to deliver what we're looking for, we would really need to stop and reflect on what we're asking of our non-executive um, directors or non-executive board members. And perhaps there are alternative ways to achieve that diversity. So um, having panels and advisory boards and so on might be a different way to make it more possible for those individuals to step forward. So if we want um, individuals uh, from all sorts of different backgrounds to participate, we need to make it possible for them to participate. And at the moment, I would suggest being a non-executive board member is a pretty scary concept to take on and not a, you know, a difficult job. Jenny. I appreciate what you're saying there, Dr Foster. It, is a, it can be, I imagine it would be a pretty scary concept becoming a non-executive board member if you don't have that background, particularly within the medical sector itself. Um, but I guess you could apply the same logic to becoming a politician. And obviously this parliament has legislated for gender representation on public boards. So perhaps in the past, people could have argued that becoming a politician might have been too, I don't know, scary for women. So we've moved, on, I suppose, the argument on. But going back to that argument in terms of training and support, I suppose what was coming through from all of your answers there, and Linda Dunyan, you, you said no one can do it in eight hours a week. Um, Christine Lester, you said um, in the last three to four years, you've, you've kind of got to grips with the process more so. And you yourself, Dr Foster, said that getting to grips with this complex role could put some people off. So as opposed to giving the, I suppose, adequate training, do we then need to look at the current system as it is and actually make it more accessible for everybody? So look at how we use plain English, for example, in board meetings, how we make the language used by the NHS much more accessible for, for all groups in society, never mind looking at, you know, gender or disability, for example, use the language to engage um, more people in that process itself so it doesn't take, you know, more than eight hours a week, for example, um, so that it is a more accessible system. Is there something that we need to look at there in terms of making the, the board membership role more accessible to everybody? I think that's a really good point, and I would absolutely agree. It's something that we've talked a lot about in NHS Tayside and have actually um, made a lot of changes, in fact, since John Connell, our, our, our new-ish chair, came in, uh, in particular. Uh, it's it, it, what you've just said, you know, in terms of the, the, um, the density of the language that is used, the amount number of technical terms that are used, that is a real barrier. And um, I, I think that um, the NHS traditionally has been very poor at talking in plain English. Um, I, I think 
there has not been a culture of transparency. Um, so, so there's a bit of a vicious circle there, if you like. Uh, and, and that, therefore, does, not always deliberately, but inadvertently excludes. Um, so, you, you know, I think, I think that that is an important issue. But I think also the way in which we do our business is not helpful. Uh, so, for example, um, last week I was in a meeting um, for five hours. And who can you ask to do that during the week, during the day, and in, as a formal board. Now, yes, there does need to be a high degree of formality um, it, it, around a lot of the issues that we're discussing. You know, we're receiving reports on, you know, clinical care and governance and finance. You know, I mean, there, they are, you do need formality to deal with these issues effectively. But having said that, um, you, if you think about the different circumstances that we've got, it's really no surprise that it's people who are retired or semi-retired or who have very, very flexible employers um, who are able to actually sit on a board and fulfil all the functions that are expected of a non-exec. It isn't just about board or committee meetings. I think as well, the, the whole process of actually getting a public appointment, now I, I went through answering um, a Press and Journal advert. If you go on the public appointments website now, um, for board members in, in Scotland, it's very competency-based. It's a very technical way of applying for a role. And, you know, I would struggle doing that. I really would. And I've, I've looked at them recently because I'm coming to the end of the term that I'm in. And it's a real struggle to do that. So I think if you're wanting a, 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 an ordinary young person to do that, you're really looking for an extraordinary young person to even get through that part of the process. For my, for my point, I would absolutely agree with you. I think we need to change. Um, and if we want diversity, we just need to move with the times. Um, and I'd be absolutely up for that. I think we need to make sure that our boards are speaking in plain English. Um, often, uh, as a non-exec board member, I, my, my role is to say, hang on a minute, can we just explain what that means? Um, and just make sure that we are speaking in a language that's entirely intelligible. Um, and we've not descended into sort of professional gobbledygook. Um, and that's really, really important. I think also... Our, for, our, our meetings tend to be very formal, and that's you know it inhibits some of the, the structure, and it does limit people to asking the questions they really want to ask. And again, we can be much more flexible about the way we meet. We can have less formal meetings. We have board seminars, for example, in between meetings, which are not taking place in public, which allows people to be more comfortable at asking questions, um, and all sorts of different settings. And again, I think uh, we need to be sensible about the length of meetings that we have. It's no longer acceptable to expect people to sit for three hours in a meeting because that's the way we've always done it. Um, and we need to take regular breaks and, and be accommodating. So I think there's all sorts of different things that boards can do to be more accommodating. Um, and we, we do need to absolutely do that. Um, but I do, uh, I go back to stressing that we need to think about what we're asking people to do as well. Um, and, and your analogy is absolutely right. We can elect politicians, uh, you know, at any age as an adult, but we don't ask them to be the first minister straight off, you know, and that's the thing. And it's about, we, we need to make sure that we are sensible in what we're asking people and we use them for what they're actually asked to do, um, which is holding us to account. Um, and the bigger and wider range of people we can get to do that, the better. Um, and the more we can encourage them to ask those questions, the better a system we will have in the end. Thank you. Drew from Sandra. Uh, thank you very much. It, it seems to me what you're explaining, um, a number of the population would actually be put off, quite frightened to go ahead. But the one I wanted to pick up on was the fact it affects people's benefits. Uh, and you can have, obviously, people who are working are on benefits also. Uh, so it's not just people who you know, are not working. That could be near enough half the population that are basically been stopped. Uh, so I think it's something that we really need to look at in this committee. And I, I didn't realise that, Christine, and thank you so much for, for raising that point. But my big worry is that half the population are being excluded, one, because they're in benefits, and two, because it just seems so formal that people are frightened off. Even once they get there, they're frightened off. I was on benefits when I actually came to this role, so that's why I'm mm. aware of it. And my um, job seekers allowance was stopped when I when I got my uh, um, and luckily I had a small widow's pension so the, the, that enabled me to continue but I mean I was you know other people wouldn't have been so lucky absolutely thank you for that thanks very much Ivan uh, thank you convener and thanks for, for coming along to talk to us uh, this morning very 
illuminating so far. Um, and I'm particularly um, taken by what you said, Dr. Foster, about form follows function. I think it's, it is important, I think, to understand what the purpose of the non-execs is. Um, and and, it, and I, I can get all the points about, yeah, it's, it's difficult and it's scary, but at the end of the day, you're asking people to hold an organisation to account that's spending £13 billion of taxpayers' money and that's responsible for the lives and well-being of hundreds of thousands of people. So if it wasn't a big, scary job, then there'd be something wrong, I think. Um, so I suppose just to drill down a wee bit in terms of the, the clarity on what the role is, I mean, is that job description written down somewhere and is what is written down what you think it should be or should it be something different? The job description is in, when you apply for the public appointment, it, it is set out. Um, I can't remember what it's called. It's a rule description, I think. And um, so there, it, it is set out. But I think without actually having um, spoken to somebody who is an existing non-exec, you don't really know exactly what that means. Um, I was previously on the board of what was then the Care Commission, and I would say that that probably was a closer fit to the description and the expectation. I think the territorial boards, I've never spoken to non-exec that isn't meeting, you know, isn't, wouldn't say the same as we're, we're sitting here saying today. Um, so I, uh, the, I think it's the expectation that's the issue. Um, the description in terms of the role of the board member, I think is, concentrates on the governance role strictly the governance role and in some respects that is the most important part of your role you are a board member and as I said before this is something that I've really had to work very hard with IJB members on um, to actually get them to appreciate that it is also a board and with that goes certain responsibilities they've signed the code of conduct you know there's a lot flows from that and that would be true to anybody coming on a board um, so I but it's the additional expectations that I think is where that's where the lack of information is, because it's it, it it's a real opportunity to do other things. I mean, I'm a member, a member of the Community Planning Partnership Board in Person Can Ross. Obviously, the IGB have done other things um, as a board member, but it doesn't it's, it does not fit into the time. I mean, I think a practical. Um, suggestion that I've certainly made in the, in the past within our board is that there um, we should look to create opportunities for people to to buddy or shadow existing non-execs, particularly when we, when we know there are vacancies going to come up. Um, and likewise, when new people are appointed, I actually think if there could be a system whereby their remuneration kicks in before they come on the board, so that they actually would be able to come in for a sort of pre-induction, if you like. So again, marrying up with um, not just board, not just non-exec board members, but also with some of the executives to get a sense of the language, the culture, the issues before they actually then sit down at a board table. I think that would that would help everybody, not not just people who are currently underrepresented. I think. Um one of the other big issues, and, and you mentioned language and, and accessibility of language, is just the amount of reading you have to do. So I, 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 I live in rural Murray, so if I come down to Edinburgh, um, I, it, I have to come down the day before. I have a big pile of stuff to read, which I can do sat at home at the kitchen table. But um, if I come down to Edinburgh, as I did on Sunday, because there was a master class yesterday uh, for board members and then this meeting today, I've still got to go back. I've got a board meeting on Thursday. I've got a pile of stuff that's literally that thick that arrived on Friday to my house that I'm going to read through. So um, you do get better at that, but there's no doubt about it. Those papers could be so much better and concise. You just have to look at, for instance, Audit Scotland reports. <laughs> which are really clear, concise um, paperwork. It can be done. Um, and you challenge it and it gets a wee bit better for a while and then it just creeps up again. That part of it is, 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 is a nightmare, really. And it could be so much better. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm, I'm Just specifically on that point, and it kind of ties into something else, um, round about if the job is to hold the execs to account, then how effective are non-execs at that? 
Um, and as a kind of supplementary to that, do you think the reason the papers are so big and complicated and the language is so difficult is to, in some ways, perhaps make it more difficult for non-execs old execs to account? Dare I yes. say it deliberately? I wouldn't say that it's done deliberately. I think it's that the landscape is so complicated that when you come to talk about something, there's so much background to it. Um, it's all done in appendices, which for actually for executive colleagues, that's their bread and butter. That's what they live and breathe. So it's an attempt actually just to put all the information on the table, in my experience. But because I only do it not as... Uh, I don't live and breathe it as executive colleagues do. So I, th I, I don't think that's the case at all. But there's no doubt about it. It could be clearer. And it could come in bits before the meeting. You know, it does, doesn't have to come the week before. Um, we have quite a good um, way of doing things in NHS Grand Prix. We have seminars, but I would say those are informal briefings almost where you can have that opportunity to all work together. That um, was a good thing when it started seven years ago when I started doing it. With the integration landscape and everything changing, there's now so much more with regional development, integration, that actually those seminars are taken up with other things almost as well as the board business itself. So it just becomes very difficult to do within the time that you've got to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up to that question, how effective do you think non-execs are at holding execs to account? Well, I personally hold the chief executive to account, um, and um, that I think we're quite good at doing that. Okay. I mean, if, if I could perhaps come in on the, the question of the volume of papers. Um, this is something that in Tayside we've done a lot of work on over the last few years and we have vastly reduced the number of papers because we were getting hundreds and hundreds of pages and you couldn't possibly read them. Um, so a, a lot of work was done to revise the committee structure, to delegate responsibility to the committees, but at each board meeting we receive a chair's assurance report from each of the standing committees, and that brings out any of the issues which need to come to the board's attention. Um, and so the board has an opportunity to then, you know, request further information, or if the board needs to actually take a decision, then that will come by that route. Um, we've also streamlined the reporting around performance. So there's been a lot of work done to try and change the systems to reduce that side of the workload for the non-execs. And it, it does enable you to be more effective. I think there's been also what I've seen as a lot of work done around listening to the non-execs and what we need in order to fill, fulfill our role more effectively. And that's covered things like plain English that, that we talked about before. It's good to hear. Thanks. So I, I would just say that um, if I could confess that as an executive director, I, I dread those piles of papers just, just the same <laughs> as my colleagues do. They're equally daunting and equally difficult to get through. And often it's the wee small hours by the time that you've read through all the papers for the next meeting. And they are frequent. And, and we have a lot of those meetings. Um, I think the, the difficulty we face is there is a, there, there is a, a I'm going to call it a culture um, within the NHS that feels that in order to deliver governance, in order to deliver accountability and in order to be open, all of those papers need to be produced and entered into the public record. Um, and so actually I think it would be very re refreshing to get some guidance or some help to say actually you don't need to produce that many papers for every board meeting to be a public body and to be being held to account. Um, and that would actually be quite helpful. I think in our own board, we've actually reduced the number of papers, again, as, been, as it has been described um, quite considerably um, in recent times, largely by expediency more than anything, because the, the, we simply don't have the number of people to produce that, that paper anymore. Um, and we have a smaller exec team, so we can't, can't manage it. Um, and uh, I think it is important that we try and reduce those papers. But equally, if you produce something that that's, that's that thick, you're absolutely right. You're burying the facts in, in a mountain of paper. And actually, um, if you can make the key points in a couple of pages of A4, that would be absolutely fine. But I think as officials within, within the NHS, we'd need to be clear that that was good enough um, and that we weren't actually failing the public by not being sufficiently open and not producing sufficient information. But if that balance was there, then there could actually be, a, I think, a revolution in some of those board papers. Um, the other thing I just think it's important to say is just to check that everyone's familiar with the structure of boards because NHS boards are, are structured differently to other public organisations in that the, the chief executive is the principal accountable officer and is appointed directly by 
um, the Cabinet Secretary. Um, the, the Executive Directors, like myself, um, are also appointed directly by the Cabinet Secretary, and the non-execs are also appointed. So the Board is, is comprised of a group of individuals who share responsibility for running that large public organisation. Um, you're right, it's a huge amount of public money that we're in control of. In our case, it's £550 million. And that's quite a lot for, for me uh, to take on, and I do feel personally accountable for that spend and for not overspending that money. Um, we we absolutely follow that. Um, and that's different to the other agencies that we deal with. So um, in a local authority, for example, the, the um, councillors effectively are in control and the staff work for the councillors, and that's a different model to the way the NHS currently runs. And again, other, other public bodies run in a different way. So it's important to just be careful that, that we're, we're familiar with the structure and how it works and, and thinking about how, that's, how, that work, how, how that function is delivered. Excellent. Thank you very much. I'd like to move on to questions around involving... Uh, staff and the public, and uh, start with Alison Johnson. Thank you, convener, and, and good morning. Um, I think your evidence so far has, you know, helped us understand how challenging a role is and, and what a responsibility you have, even in terms of getting your head round the the facts and figures. And you know, there's a lot of information that you have to scrutinise. But during last week's session, um, some of the witnesses felt that the lack of public trust sometimes in boards is because of a tendency to, to inform and perhaps consult in a way that sometimes appears less than meaningful. So I'd just like to get your views on whether or not the correct mechanisms are in place to enable the public staff and the third sector to get involved in the NHS decision making on an ongoing basis. And if you think that public engagement is hardwired into the process, in the way that I think we'd probably all feel it should be. Who would like to start with that large question? Christine. Yeah, start, yeah. So I think public engagement is really, really important. Um, we take it very seriously. We work hard to get uh, public engagement. We have, uh, and that is, is in a whole different range of ways. So starting with um, you know it, it, communications and trying to actually keep the public informed through our relationship with the media and the information that we send out. Um, then you probably get down to things like the fact that we do have our meetings in public, we publish all our minutes and so on. Um, we then have um, active involvement of members of the public or patient representatives in various different groups. So in, in most of our planning groups, um, in our clinical governance committee, for example, you'll find a member of the public sitting, w watching what we're doing and asking challenging questions again. So that, I think, really helps us to focus on the fact that we're actually serving our public and, and remembering that's, that's what we're about. Um, we also have a number of different public panels that we ask questions of, and that helps us to be uh, informed. Um, there's, I've, I've forgotten the name of the website, but there's a public website where individuals can ask questions of the NHS, and we're very, very um, energetic in, in following that and responding very quickly. So if you post a question on that website or a concern about care you've received in our health board, you'll... Care opinion. Care opinion, that's the one, thank you very much. Um, so we use care opinion a lot, and if a member of the public posts something on care opinion, I'd be surprised if you don't get a, a response within 48 hours, possibly a lot quicker. Um, often it's same day you'll get someone saying really sorry that you've had that challenge can we direct you to how you can access that service um, so that's been very very successful for us and it's, it's using technology so so that's helped enormously um, I, I think that we need to make sure that we are um, responding to public opinion in a realistic way though because we we get the people that we get so we will get people who have a particular specialist interest on a committee. Um, those individuals, again, are very hardworking, um, very committed, but they tend to stay with us for quite a, lo a long time. So we don't, got, we don't get a lot of turnover. Um, I think reflecting on those individuals, it's probably the case that we don't get a, a real cross-section of our local society, um, and that would be something that would be better. The panels are obviously much better at that, um, but again, um, you don't necessarily get that. Um, but it is something that we're really, really committed to, um, and we want to try and get that public engagement, and it's important to us. Pause at that point, let my colleagues join in. Yeah, um, I, I think um, that is important. I think we're also embracing some of the new ways of doing things, social media, Facebook, Twitter. Yeah. I think um, certainly over the winter period, NHS Grand Prix, we had um, very successful um, uh, saying, you know, 
the, the, this is how many people have fallen over, you know, the pavements are slippy, you know, uh, that sort of being aware, go to your pharmacist. That was really successful. The, the, the Twitter was shared and shared again, We've got loads of Facebook likes. That's a really good way of doing it. I think the other thing is don't forget, it's an honest conversation we need to ha be having with the public. It's not just, you know, when it's winter and it's not just, you know, when we've got good news. The changing landscape means we should really be engaging with them all the time. And I think part of the issue there is that we are driven by media interest. And so we're almost a bit fearful about being having that honest conversation, about saying what we can do and what we can't do and why. Um, and I, I think that is a real challenge going forward now for us. Um, and, and it has to be an honest conversation. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Um, I think that um, I would draw a distinction um, between information giving and communication, um, where I, I think the NHS actually does quite a good job and, and some of the techniques you've just heard about um, are, are effective in that. Um, it's certainly easier to tell the NHS what you think if you're a member of the public than it used to be. But if we're talking about genuine engagement, um, then I think we need to look further down. And I think we need to be looking at the localities within the IJB structure, at um, certainly in Pen Perth and Ken Ross under this community planning partnership, there are local action partnerships, and they're working very closely with the localities, with the IJB localities. Um, the strategic commissioning plan for um, Perth and Ken Ross IJB was a huge public engagement exercise run by the local third sector interface, but with funding um, from the public sector. So I, I, I see this as something which is starting down here with individuals, with neighbourhoods, with communities, with the involvement not just of those who are explicitly about health, but looking at community development trusts, looking at those who are getting involved in issues um, which um, may lead to social prescribing, for example, walking groups or whatever. Um, so looking at what, what's happening at a community level and feeding that up through the system so that the boards, the NHS boards, have actually got a, a very robust... I hate that word, everyone uses it now, but a very robust sounding board um, that really tells them what's happening on the ground. Um, and, I mean, we had a model, uh, to be very briefly, but we had a model in Aberfeldy, which I think demonstrates something which, to me, is absolutely key to sharing the difficult information that we've just been talking about, which is giving communities ownership of the data, giving communities ownership of the complexity of the issues. Because if people are actually trusted with the information that we have at our disposal, they can really help, it can be a real joint effort to actually arrive at solutions which people will support because they absolutely understand it. And I remember sitting in a public meeting in Aberfeldy and the woman next to me who I didn't know turned around and she said, you do get awful wedded to bricks and mortar, don't you? My daughter was born in the hospital, I was born in the hospital, but actually, it's, it's got to go. And because she'd been part of the process, she concluded that. And I think that we need to see more of that happening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ash. No, I think, uh, Michael, the question that I have has been covered by the answer to Alison Johnson's yeah. question. Miles. Thank you, convener, and good morning to the panel. I wanted to develop further Alison Johnson's point there. Um, and a piece of research which the Scottish Parliament's Independent Information Centre provided us um, brought some results out which I think surprised us all. And it was actually suggesting that the majority of members of NHS health boards believe they're not always honest with the public about their decisions. And that's um, the survey, I think, had a response from half of all, all members. Total 59% said they were most, mostly, sometimes, are hardly ever transparent on this. How do you think that can be improved in the future? Because I think that's where, just like we've heard, there is that disconnect, I think, sometimes between decisions being taken by boards and then the public not feeling they part of that decision-making process. I think that's the culture change. 
And if I could give you another example, which you may well be aware of, um, it was in our um, redesign of inpatient adult mental health and learning disability services in Tayside. Oh, about two and a half years ago or more, um, they, there had been the beginnings of a consultation process, but then it came to the board um, to ask us to, to take a decision. And myself and, and a councillor member of the board um, were very unhappy at being asked to do this because we felt that the process had been inadequate. Now, we knew that would delay the decision. We knew there was pressure on us, but we felt that the public had not actually had a chance to be involved meaningfully in the process, that people who use the service, the carers, the staff within the services, had not actually had the opportunity to be properly engaged in informing the decision and in, as it turned out, you know, helping with option appraisals and arriving at a preferred option. So the, the process was pushed back, as I say, wasn't a universally popular decision, but it was the right decision. And that's where I think non-execs actually need to be quite firm, draw on their own lived experience and, and professional experiences, um, and, and change a decision that would otherwise have been made. If we're serious about being honest with the public, we need to recognise that that takes a certain skill set, it takes investment, and it takes a certain amount of time, but it doesn't need to be an inordinate amount of time. I, I think the honest conversation, it just needs to start, because um, we're, we're quite good at the good news or saying it in so many words that nobody else understands it. Um, clear, concise language, tell it like it is, and just do it all the time, because life's like that. Um, the NHS is no different to anywhere else. It's challenging sometimes, challenging quite a lot. Talk about money. Talk about how much it costs if you don't turn up to your GP surgery or your outpatient's appointment. I think that's really important. We don't do that. We do the good news. We don't do it all together. And so when the bit of bad news or not so good news comes out, it's a big deal. But actually, life is like that. And I, I just think the whole thing around language, about telling it like it is, is something we should be doing in the board meetings. That, and that comes through the papers as well. Thank you. I, I think what you're talking about is public confidence in the system, really, isn't it? That, that's, that's the issue that's at, at the heart of this. Um, and I do think it's very challenging in the world that we live in to maintain public confidence in the service, because by the very nature of the world that we live in, people challenge everything that goes wrong. Um, they challenge uh, targets, they challenge things that they see that are not right, and we're not actually that good at celebrating success. Um, we're in the, the, it's the 70th anniversary of the National Health Service this year. We started it in 1948. The National Health Service has never been better. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I challenge anyone to prove anything otherwise. It's never been better. It does spectacular things. Every day we're doing new interventions that were not possible before. We're saving lives. And it is free at point of delivery to everyone. And it's the en envy of the world. It really is. There's, there's nowhere else that can do what we do in Scotland in terms of the National Health Service. We should be proud of it. And yet, actually, we, it belongs to us. Um, and we want it to be great, and we spend an awful lot of time trying to solve little problems around the edges, and, and it sounds like it's constantly in crisis. Um, and there are challenges there, and I think we're partly, um, we're partly guilty of believing our own hype, in that we've started, even our non-exec board members believe that we're constantly rolling from one crisis to the next. If you actually stop and think objectively about the quality of the service that we're delivering, um, about the fact that we've continued to sustain that delivery despite all the financial pressures that we've faced in recent years and austerity and all the other things that we've had to, to do. Um, you compare that with, you know, in, in, in the past, we used to have NHS uplifts every year of 7, 8, 9% financial uplift. For the last decade, we've run almost flat cash or 1% increases because that's the way public finances are now. And it's the same for everyone in the public service. It's the same for, for government. Um, and yet we've continued to sustain a national health service that's free for everyone. We're not turning people away. We're delivering fantastic new services. Um, I was just listening to the, the television this morning, watching the television this morning, and they were talking about 6,000 premature babies who are alive every year, who wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for the National Health Service. We couldn't do any of that before we started out in 1948. But we do really struggle. Uh, and we, if you actually go back to... I, was re I did a presentation at a conference last year um, and to do that, that, I went back to look at some of the original launch documents from the National Health Service. 
And within a few months of la launching the National Health Service in 1948, I think it was the Minister for Health was already saying, we're going to struggle with this service because expectations are rising, technology is moving ahead and the population is getting bigger. And here we are 70 years later and we're still facing the same challenges. But we've done it. You know, we continue to deliver this fantastic National Health Service. And sometimes we forget to celebrate that and forget to remember that actually it's a really good thing. And yes, all around the edges there are challenges and we need to get better and we need to work on that and it's tough and the money's tight. Um, but actually, you know, sometimes we, we get wrapped up in it being constantly in crisis. And if, if we say that... The public believes that, and then they lose confidence in the service, and, and that's the challenge. So there's a big thing about how we maintain public confidence, and I think when, when, when we say we're not being honest with the public, that's part of the root of it, because we're dealing with all these challenges, and we're trying to battle against the idea that it's all in crisis, and we're saying, no, no, it's all right, but actually we know it's really difficult. Um, and I think that's where you get that tension between are we being really honest with our public and, and telling them about you know, what the challenges are. Um, just a very brief supplementary to that. And part, part of the research um, pointed towards then decision making, which you take, then not being able to, to, to you know, feed in from what the Scottish government or UK government want to see. And I was interested to find out from from what we heard. Um, do you feel there's political interference then around your decision making processes from central government? And do you have any examples of that where you felt that actually being able to take a decision and take the public with you? is something you can't do because central government um, have, have either made it known that they would not like to see that happen. I'm not aware of any decisions. I mean, I know there were quite a lot of comments in the survey results about the fact that clearly, you know, the health boards have to have to meet Scottish government set targets and, and be accountable to government. I'm not aware of, spe of a specific instance in my time on the board where government has lent on NHS Tayside to make a decision that we didn't want to make or to not take a decision that we did want to take. Um, I, wish, I wish I could say similar. Um, I think the, time, the, the timing of elections of, is quite often stymies discussion along that period of what's called parda. Um, I think you can have a momentum going and then it all stops and then it all has to start again. And it's a giant tanker. So if you're trying to turn it around and do things differently and change, that whole cycle of local and then um, national elections, and boy, we've had a few of those recently, haven't we? Um, you know, <laughs> you know that um, that that does it, it. It doesn't stop the discussion, but it definitely holds things back because you can have a trajectory and you can have the public engaged, you can have your local politicians engaged, you can have your national politicians engaged, and then you have to stop, you know, and then it takes time to get going again. That has been a real issue, I think, in, in, in fostering change, certainly within a rural community where we're wanting to do and change things differently. Issue of uh, public confidence that you just described, uh, Graham Foster, um, and with public confidence or building public confidence, um, you need to manage expectations of service um, adequately. Now, I can only really speak to NHS Lothian as an Edinburgh MSP, um, but I'd, uh, I mean, I'm lost count now of the number of constituents who have come in to see me because of protracted waiting time delays, where they have been led to believe that they were in one bracket of waiting times, whether that's a 12-week treatment guarantee or um, any sort of notional um, expectation, which has been then blown out of the water subsequently, maybe halfway through that period, by an indication they're going to have to wait significantly months longer than that. Can you give us an idea of how each of your boards um, deals with expectation around waiting times, particularly when you've got statutory, statutory targets to meet? As you say, it is about public confidence and, and the, the whole waiting times issue, I think, is one of the areas where we face challenges um, and expectations are very high. And I think we actually generate a lot of those expectations ourselves and it's perhaps because we are not uh, realistic about what we can do. Um, I think related to the previous question, um, which I, I didn't answer, but the, the previous question was about... Um, challenges that we face and um, perhaps times when we're not able to make our own decisions. Ultimately, the boards are accountable for our own decisions and we're free to make those decisions. Um, but we do face continual pressure to do ever more every year. 
Um, and one example of that is new technologies and new drugs. Um, and it is very, very difficult to explain to the public that actually the very latest new cancer treatment that perhaps costs hundreds of thousands of pounds is not actually as important as making sure that we clear that waiting list or we give everyone the core life-saving treatment that they need. Um, we find it very, very difficult when uh, we're challenged with what about this new technology that's being done in America or has been done in England, why can't we do it in Scotland? We must do it now, and these things are expensive and difficult. Um, so it is actually quite hard to set our priorities locally because all of these things do come in from left field. Um, and there's a lot of discussion going on, um, particularly around the medical directors in Scotland, to try and bring some order to that and try and reduce those new expectations coming in and saying, stop, can we think about the cost of these new things that are constantly being added to the expectation? Um, and I could, I could probably talk for a whole hour about different examples of, of decisions that are made out with the control of boards which suddenly increase our costs. Um, and those are quite challenging, so we have to manage those. Um, an infection control thing that we were asked to do recently was, was asked of us by an infection control nurse in a national agency following an inspection. And for us, that collectively would cost between sixty and £100,000 to implement, and I could find no evidence base for it whatsoever, and I could see no benefit to patients from it but a national expert had thought it would be a good idea if we changed the way we clean uh, clean from this way to that way. Um, and that doesn't get any governance. It doesn't get any checks. There's no cost impact assessment of that. Someone in a national agency says, change the guidance, add this new level, raise the bar, and we just have to dig into our coffers and find the cost. So that's really challenging. Um, and those are the realities of what a health board faces every day. And so I think there are questions to be asked about all the different agencies that, that prov produce rules um, some of them are entirely valid, some of them are less so, and do they actually stop and think about the cost to the public purse of those decisions that they're taking and the impact of those decisions? But to come back specifically to your question, which was about waiting times, I think it's really, really important that we don't lead patients into believing they're going to get something and then not deliver. Um, so we need to be very realistic about what we can deliver. Um, and we are very guilty of currently putting people into pathways which drive them down a line which says, you need an operation, it'll be done in 12 weeks, there's no other alternative. And actually, very often, those individuals have a lot of other alternatives, and we know if you ask doctors, they wouldn't have that operation in the first place, so they'd certainly delay it because they'd follow another pathway. Um, you take the example with someone, we, we were talking about knee operations before we came in, and you take the example of someone who's got a painful knee, um, and they, they go to see their GP with a painful knee, and the GP says, I'll send you to an orthopedic surgeon. The minute they see that orthopedic surgeon, and the orthopedic surgeon says, you could have a knee replacement, the clock starts ticking, you're on the clock, you have to get your knee replacement. And what we don't do is say, you, could, you would benefit from a knee replacement, but actually you might also benefit from physiotherapy, um, and that could keep you without any replacement for another four or five years, possibly a decade. Uh, you might benefit from this drug that might help. You might choose to just keep what you're doing and change your behavior. What's important to you? And we're really bad at stopping and saying, what's actually important to you? We're, because we've got all these waiting times and things, we, 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 we slavishly follow the pathway. And as soon as you're potentially a candidate for a knee replacement, the clock's ticking and we shove you through that tube and we give you a knee replacement and you go home. And you sometimes see people are sort of like, well, I went to the doctor with a sore knee and I've had my knee replaced. You know, how did that happen? Um, and, but that's because we're so obsessed with, with that. And so I think we need to be much more honest with our public about what we can do and what the alternatives are. And if we're going to say to someone you need a replacement, yes, we should absolutely do it in good time. But we also need to be a bit more sensible about when we put people into those pathways and give them the alternatives and make sure it's what's right for them at the time. Because I'm quite convinced we're doing a lot of things just now that are not actually in the best interest of the patients. We're doing them because we think we ought to. It's funny that you said that about knee replacements. I think one of the things I, I learned most recently about knees is that, um, and we were talking about obesity strategies, that actually if you if you lose one kilo in weight, it actually, it, for your knee, it's eight kilos because of the way a, a knee works, yeah. because of the mechanism, which is fantastic. You know, one kilo is really achievable. So if you've got a sore knee, go home and lose a kilo first. You know, it's infinitely preferable to, to waiting for weeks and weeks and then going into hospital. So and um, yes. I just thought I'd throw that in because I, that was fascinating for me because eight kilos looks unachievable. One kilo, I'm quite happy. I'll go for that. Anyway, yeah. going back um, to, to your question, I think... Um, it's a real challenge that um, the waiting times in, in NHS Grampian, we've chosen to clinically prioritise people. Though, so those people who need um, treatment will be seen quickly and first before anybody else. 
those waiting times are published on our website, but they're only published if you're in that um, pathway. So if you're a member of the general public, you wouldn't even be able to find that on our website. So I'm back to what I'm talking about, the honest conversation about what expectations are of the NHS and what it can provide for you when your knee gets sore. So I, I think um, that, that would be my point there. I think you're also talking about this realistic medicine um, that we've all read about, we've talked about in boards, we've, mm. we, we, we're, we're in, but actually we're still shying away from having that public conversation about what realistic medicine actually means to you before you go to your GP surgery about what your expectations should be. Um, okay, can, can I ask just, I think... We've touched on it to a, uh, from a couple of different directions around seminars and around external advice. Is there a sense, before I ask colleagues to ask directly about IGBs, is there a sense that the development of IGBs and of a regional level of health, pro health uh, provision has reduced the strategic role of boards? Do, do board members feel that their strategic grip is less than it was, say, a couple of years ago? so no. um, I, I, and this is very, kind of very front of mind at, at the moment I mean NHS Tayside has been developing a number of strategies surgical services and what have you primary care um, under the umbrella of our integrated clinical strategy and that's a really important part of the landscape for IGBs not just for IGBs but for community planning partnerships as well um, I think it's about people find sorry the, the organizations finding their place in the new environment um, and but given the responsibilities of, of certainly the health board and I can only speak for, for Tayside in this regard um, I, I think it's actually really important that um, the health boards know what they're about in terms of their own strategy and then how that sits alongside regional strategies um, but also I would go back to what I said earlier on about ensuring that there is also a bottom-up approach and that the strategy is is informed by what's happening across the piece because if integration doesn't work if communities and individuals are not more knowledgeable and have more ownership of their own individual health if they don't have information um, and own the data own the information about what's happening locally then that's to the detriment of the health board in determining its own strategies so i think it's about a new way a new modus vivendi if you like but i don't see any diminution of the role of the health board in in st setting strategy thank you very much uh, brian whittle you know just maybe moving on uh, from the community good morning panel um Obviously, with the commencement of the IGBs and, and moving towards a sort of regional planning, you'll, you'll, there must be some kind of adaptation you're, gonna ha you're having to undertake to, to, to take in those roles of the IGBs. And I wonder if you're, are you getting, are you getting room to breathe within that in environment? Are you yeah. getting room to adapt? Uh, have you got the tools to adapt into that, uh, the boards into that role? It's a very busy world just now. Um, so I, 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 yes, you're, you're right. It's very busy just now. It's it's a congested playing field, if we use that analogy. There's a lot of things going on, and it is it's making life very difficult. I th you'll actually find that boards are probably smaller now than they've been. Um, they've less staff, have less resource, um, and we've got a bigger, more complicated structure uh, that we're trying to set up and make work. Um, I agree with the previous answer in terms of strategy. I think boards have strong strategic direction making responsibility and they're continuing to do that my own board we have a very clear healthcare strategy and a very clear health improvement strategy and we want to deliver those things um, we understand the principles of why regional planning is important but at the moment it's very much about establishing structures and processes and uh, needs assessments and planning and so on and it's not actually doing the critical joining up of regional services that we probably need it to do and we've got a bit distracted from that because we're trying to set up this new structure um, and in the integration world as a board we're absolutely committed to integration if you go back to the original integration principles that are set out in the act that's what we want to deliver 
but again, we're finding that really, really challenging because we've got sidetracked into a discussion about structures and processes and who works for the IGB and who doesn't and what's their role and what's their responsibility and who line manages who and operational delivery issues and so on. And actually, we just want to get on with doing something at the front line for patients. And that's really tricky because we've got sidetracked into all these different organisations and governance arrangements and so on at the moment. And until those settle, settle down, then it's a, real, it's a real struggle to make those things land. Um, and the core of the question is about strategic planning, and I go back to the fact my, you know, my role is strategic planning, um, and integration and the IGBs are meant to be about strategic planning, and we're almost wondering when are we going to actually start doing strategic planning in the IGBs because we've spent so much time on governance and structures that we've never actually got round to that. So at the moment, I would say boards are still doing the strategic planning, um, and we're waiting. Kirsty, um, I'm also the chair of um, Murray IGB. Um, where I think we have a very different scenario. Yes. We 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 found. Um, don't forget, integration is quite new as well. I mean, it's not it's not even two years old. So we've been given a lot to do. Some of it is um, uh, from from a Murray perspective. We've been given things to deal with that the health neither the health board nor the local authority has wanted to do up until that point. So it doesn't come um, with with any. Um, good news on the horizon, <laughs> for want of a better word. But the opportunity is great. Um, Murray was one of the first pl places to have a community health and social care partnership before an IJB. So we, we did have people working together in the same building. They were all sitting in different offices. Now they're all in the same office. You know, we have health people who are managed by um, local authority employees and vice versa. Um, Murray's a small place. I think that's probably made it easier um, because it's all the same people at the end of the day. You know, it's quite a small, structured environment. Um, I think the strategic planning side we've been able to do, I think we're between Highland um, and Grampian. We are part of Grampian, but we're on that A96 corridor. So strategically, Murray's in a, in a, in a good place to be doing that planning. So we are doing that. The regional side, definitely not driven locally I think at the moment that's been driven nationally and then through the health board structure I think from an IGB and a local authority perspective um, less input uh, is, there, is there a danger of duplication uh, of work through the, from the IGB and the, and the board and, and how do we avoid that my perspective, but I'm, I don't know about anybody else. No, I, I don't, I don't recognise um, that. I don't think there is a, a, a danger of duplicate. Well, there might be a danger, but I don't see it in practice. Okay. Um, I was up at Pitt Lockery with um, members of the IJB uh, on Friday, and um, we were extremely encouraged because, you know, you, you, there is a, a layer at which you would say integration is, is struggling. Um, and that's getting that kind of management structure in place. But what's happening on the ground is people are just getting their sleeves rolled up and getting on with it and doing some fabulous work. Um, uh, so it's it's really important that you know we we on the board of the IJB can can get you know so wound up in in thinking always about you know the finance the you know the heavy papers that we have in front of us um, but it's actually good sometimes just to be reminded that people have embraced integration mm -hmm. and are getting on and making it happen and we were sitting with people from health people from the council people from third sector community organizations so I'm very encouraged by what's happening on the ground we just need to you know crack the structures and get to integrated budgets because I think that's key to making it happen properly. That the, the, the question was, is there a danger of duplication? My initial answer would be absolutely not because it's the same people doing the work, actually. You know, the IGB is, is, a, is, a, is a new planning committee, effectively. It's not a huge, great new organisation that's going to take over a lot of the work. So it's always the same people and therefore there shouldn't be a danger of duplication. However, I am just minded that the, the topic of the conversation this morning is corporate governance, and the bit where there is duplication is we, you know, we were talking earlier about those piles of papers and big, big meetings and all that um, administrative burden, and there's definitely a duplication of that now because we've got a lot more meetings, and you won't see the size of board meetings decreasing by the corresponding number of new papers that you'll see at IJB meetings. And, and for a small board like Fourth Valley, it's certainly a struggle for our non-execs and execs to support the, the sheer number of meetings that we've got because we've got a number of IJBs to support with a number of community planning partnerships to support and a board 
where previously we just had the one structure. So there's a lot of duplication of the admin and the governance, but not of the actual work. Just a, a supplementary to that. Uh, obviously, Audit Scotland did a report in 2015 uh, talking about governance accountability. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that here you say that basically you feel that you know integrated joint boards, etc., are moving in the right direction. Do you think, excuse me for sniffing, do you think the governance has improved, uh, you know, since, you know, the integration boards were actually introduced? Uh, obviously, there's lots of layers, as you say, councillors, et cetera, being the regional boards as well, because some people seem to feel that uh, local boards and uh, the accountability and regional boards, they're a bit kind of blurred. Uh, I just wondered what you would feel about that. You know, is it much easier now? Well, possibly not, but it, will it be much easier? Is there a time scale for that? Um, can I can I say something? Yeah. Um, if you look at the legislation and the role of an integration joint board and that of an NHS board, it's really very clear what the governance and the accountability structure is. There is quite a lot of talk about it being unclear, and from, and my personal view is a lot of people don't like it. So actually, it's easy for them to say that's not very clear to me, as opposed to I don't like it. And that is from both um, the local authority and the NHS boards, yeah. you know, because it's a lot, it's a, lo a loss of control, um, for want of uh, really, it's human nature. So I think they throw these things in the red herrings. Um, I think if you really look at the structure, the accountability pathways, these are legislated bodies. You know, they're, they're, they're professional people there doing a really, really good job. The chief officers um, are fantastic at what they do. And, and we have three very good um, chief officers. In fact, one of them is, is leaving Aberdeen, actually, to come to Edinburgh shortly, under the NHS Grampian within the Integration Joint Boards. So I think I think a lot of it is 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 just in the wind. It's It's not liked... So we'll throw in the thing about governance. That's my own personal view. Like cultural change that's needed within... The it's a definite cultural change yeah. that's needed. And, and that goes across um, the regional planning environment as mm -hmm. well. Um, you know, that kind of power and control. You yeah. know, health would like it done that way. Local authorities would like it done. IGBs, actually, are where you actually want that done. Because, actually, it's down to the communities in which, where, where people mm. want to go for their health care. As, as witnesses, we haven't met beforehand and we don't actually yeah. know each other. So I, I had no idea Christine was going to say that, but I just want to say I absolutely agree. I, I think if you go back to the original legislation and you go back to the integration principles, it's absolutely clear what we're trying to achieve and it's absolutely clear how we're meant to go about it. I think what you've got is a, a complex environment in Scotland. You've got what, 32 local authorities, 31 IJBs, 14 health boards, territorial boards, and everyone's trying to kind of twist it to the way they want it to be. And that's caused a lot of difficulty because people are looking for local solutions um, and some people have one vision and others have another. And if one is to be critical, I don't think the guidance has been that clear in terms of sticking to the original act and saying this is what we expect. And that's to allow people a bit of room to, to move and a bit and to develop and, you know, have different solutions to the same problems. But if we just got on with doing what the act told us to do in the first place, I think Christine's absolutely right. It's very clear what we're meant to be doing. Thank you. Uh, Emma Harper, did you still have a question in this area? Yeah, yep. it's mm -hmm. um, similar to uh, what uh, Sandra White has asked, but I'm really encouraged to hear what you're saying about um, targets, timeframes. Sir Harry Burns mentioned targets and timeframes and looking at, we shouldn't just be looking at 12 weeks, 16 weeks, whatever. It is about what matters to the person and realistic medicine. And maybe you need pulmonary rehab before you go for a knee replacement or a weight loss package for that one kilo. So I'm really encouraged to hear about that and the fact that the IJBs are about integrating in the community. So um, I'm just wondering if there are some difficulties in scrutinising when uh, regional boards might deliver cancer care. For instance, NHS to Fries and Galloway send patients to Greater Glasgow, NHS Lothian and Ayrshire and Arran for urology and cancer services. So is it difficult to scrutinise when things are measured that are regional wide rather than just simply board wide? Difficult to scrutinise. It does introduce challenges. I think in Scotland we're, we're guilty of, of trying to... Um, 
compare 14 health boards and assume all f we tend to assume all 14 health boards are exactly the same and actually we can compare them by just creating a league table and say who's best and who's worst and often the boards are very very different um, and you know the, the challenges that Highland has and the pathway that they have into care is quite different to the pathway that Orkney has which is different to Dumfries and Galloway which is different to Glasgow who has everyone very close um, and, and that leads to challenges so actually I think in some ways the regions will help um, because as an exec director, I quite often get involved in trying to address issues and challenges where people have been delayed in their treatment, or I quite often get approached by other boards who are looking after our patients, saying, here's a list of all the patients you've sent us in the last six months, can you just review them and make sure that you still need them seen? Um, and I'm thinking, hang on a minute, they've been on a waiting list you know, for six months, I can't stop now and, and send them somewhere else, you just have to see them, don't be ridiculous. But we move people around and we do these things between boards which are not helpful, so, so, actual regions should, so actually regions should get us away from that and get more towards the idea of we're looking after our patients and it doesn't actually matter if they're on a waiting list in Glasgow or a waiting list in Forth Valley or a waiting list in Lanarkshire, and it's not a competition, it's about making sure that patient gets the service they need as quickly as they possibly can. Um, and at the moment, the service would, would tend, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no gain to Glasgow for treating my patients quickly because it's my waiting list, not their waiting list, you know. And, and, and it's unhealthy, that competition, and actually regions might help us to do better by the patients ultimately. So that's, that's the big hope of doing it in a more joined up way. Okay. Okay. Neatly into our final area of questioning, uh, Dave Stewart. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I'm interested in, in having your views on sharing and learning from other boards. We, as you may know, we had some interesting feedback from our survey results uh, on that. Um, could you each tell the committee um, how much, uh, what some good examples of where you've learnt from other boards, maybe adjacent or in other parts of Scotland? requires a bit of thought whilst my colleagues are thinking I'll just say that one <laughs> one example is uh, is that I think two of two of the three of us were, were at a collective event yesterday so all of the board execs and non-execs were together at a health improvement quality improvement event yesterday where we shared good practice and and then had we finished off with individual sessions in boards where we set action plans for what we would do locally but three quarters of the day was a collective thing where we uh, networked we talked we listened to experts and we thought about how we could do things and we looked at what other boards have done so we had presentations for example from uh, NHS Lothian and what they've done about quality improvement and their quality improvement academy so we've, we've drawn lessons from that and we're going to go back to our board and think about that so that in itself was a good example that, that was taking place just just yesterday um, Kristen. I, I, I think probably the sharing and learning as is much more something that executive colleagues do mm -hmm. Than non-executives. I think um, it's not that non-executives can't learn and share amongst themselves, they certainly can, but I think it's a different conversation that we would have around, you know, uh, challenge, scrutiny, supporting each other through, especially when, you, when you've first started in the role. So I think definitely we as a board, I, I know of sharing and learning, but it's come through executive colleagues, medical directors, nursing directors, who are, who are all working together nationally and then coming back to the board in that way. I, I would uh, agree with, with Christine that um, I think it's more ad hoc for non-execs. I would also say, just um, Christine and Graham have both mentioned, you know, the national events and opportunities for networking. Um, for me, that's just a step too far. Um, you know, it, 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 if you're doing already spending some time of each day on board business, whether it be the IJB or NHS Tayside, actually taking a whole day out to do a national event I find them valuable when I've been at them, but I just can't prioritise them. So I think, you know, there is there is merit, but it's difficult. Okay, as I hinted at, the, our survey responses um, expressed some concerns that NHS is quite poor at sharing knowledge and learnings. Maybe a question for Graham. Is there any particular barriers to sharing and learning from, from other boards in your professional experience? I think there's a will. I think people would like to do it. I think there are challenges around time. I think we, we by our very nature, are quite internally focused. Um, as board members, we're trying to deliver our own targets and our own performance. Um, so my priority will always be to make sure I'm at the board meeting in Fourth Valley, not in Glasgow, helping Glasgow improve their performance. Um, that said, I don't, think there's, I, I don't think there's any lack of will. I think we get great help when we ask for it. Um, if we, if I take the example of our local... Um, a&E department where we've had some challenges around the four-hour target. We've had the Academy of Royal Colleges have been in to help us. We've had visitors from other boards. We've looked around. We've asked, you know, 
yeah, we've, we've taken lots of advice on is there anything different we could do while we're getting something wrong? Is there another model? Um, and people have been very willing to help us and very willing to give up time to do that. So I, I do think there's a willingness there. But I, I think at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, we, we do tend to focus on 14 separate health boards in terms of the way our services, it's the way it's traditionally been run. And the natural focus is to, is to worry about our own challenges and our own budget, not to, not to necessarily um, spend a lot of time reaching out to others. Um, so that's probably the impression that leads to the answer that, that you're describing. But given, given time, um, I think we could come up with lots and lots of great examples of how boards do learn from each other and we do share learning and, and staff move between boards and so on. So it's not that we have you know, 14 boards that don't speak to each other. Um, but we do have a system that is focused on 14 separate boards rather than one collective whole. My final point is uh, looking at the wider view in this, um, Healthcare Improvement Scotland has, as you know, an excellent uh, website. I looked at the, I think it's the iHub uh, recently, had some good examples. I'm interested in diabetes, for example, and I had some good examples of best practice. Is that something from your professional point of view that you find is a good development? So this is obviously centrally held, giving best practice for all boards. Is that something in your experience is extremely useful and something that could be developed? Yes, it is very helpful. Um, and for example, in, di in diabetes, we have diabetes networks as well, and the networks are very useful as well. And uh, we, y that's a very good way of trying to share best practice and, and learn and develop. Um, I'm just slightly wary of your question because I think we, we are guilty in Scotland of having spent the last decade moving our expertise from frontline boards and international agencies. So we've lots and lots of experts We've lots and lots of inspectors. Uh, we've a very uh, inspection-focused environment. We've lots of national agencies, and we've we've created a system where the natural career progression, if you're successful in your specialism, is to leave your territorial board and leave the front line and become a national expert running a some sort of national advice service, uh, which is a you know great if you're an academic, but actually it's a bit like the story we had in education a few years ago. Uh, I'd you know quite like to see a system actually where we we reverse that trend and there was greater reward for staying in your board and supporting frontline services and a bit less focus on lots of national agencies um, because uh, you know and so that would be my fear is that if if I say actually yeah, that's a great idea we lose yet more of our you know our skilled staff to go and sit in Edinburgh and Glasgow and and, and send us advice. On that one, <laughs> uh, no, indeed. Well, I'm absolutely committed to Fourth Valley and I'm staying well, there because I think so, it's the so place the to make a difference as a director of public your health. Your basic answer is look is your basic message for us is to look at best practice but to decentralize as much as possible yes yes i think we we need the uh, we need the staff in the boards the one thing boards are struggling for just now is staff actually mm -hmm. um, we, we do not have the, the, the expert staff to deliver the demands that the service is facing so mm -hmm. right thank you it's very helpful thank you very much can i thank all of our witnesses uh for the evidence they've given this morning it's extremely helpful uh to us in our proceedings we will be hearing next from the cabinet secretary where we will be putting to her some of the points raised today as some as well as evidence from previous evidence sessions. Uh, thank you very much. We'll now suspend briefly uh, to allow for a change of witnesses.
We will reconvene. Can I thank the uh, next panel of witnesses for your patience and welcome to the committee uh, uh, to uh, our second panel of the morning on NHS governance and welcome Shona Robson, the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport, accompanied by Dr. Dr. Catherine Calderwood, Chief Medical Officer, by uh, Christine McLaughlin, Director of Health Finance, and by Shirley Rogers, Director of Health, Workforce and Strategic Change. And can I invite uh, the Cabinet Secretary uh, to make an opening statement? Thanks, Convener. Uh, grateful to the Committee for the invitation to appear today and to welcome the work on governance that the Committee is undertaking. Our NHS boards are responsible for providing the vision and strategic direction through which they deliver high quality, safe and effective care to our communities. Effective governance is essential in ensuring that our health and care system functions efficiently and effectively. The corporate governance of our NHS is underpinned by legislation and a range of guidance, but we don't simply rely on these documents to ensure that governance is in place. The governance of NHS Scotland is delivered by all those who serve on our health boards. Our boards are a unique mix of non-execs drawn through an appointment system regulated by the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life's Office, executive directors who bring a range of skills and experience, and stakeholder members who represent our partnership with local authorities, workforce and the clinical community. I recognise this unique mix of members and the strengths that it brings to the governance and assurance arrangements of our health and care system, but I also recognise that we must continue to keep the makeup of boards under review to ensure that we are diverse, as Scotland is diverse, but also capable of delivering the vital governance functions that the NHS and our communities rely on. With that in mind, let me restate my commitment to delivering diversity to our boards. We're committed to the Scottish Government's Gender Balance 50-50 by 2020 pledge. More than that, we're also committed to moving away from the traditional competency-based approach to making public appointments that can act as a barrier to people applying. Working with the Commissioner for Ethical Standards, we've now begun to appoint non-executive members, not just on their skills and experience, but also on how their values match with those of the NHS. Paul Gray recently chaired an appointment panel to deliver four new chairs for our health boards, and at the heart of that process were our values of care and compassion, dignity and respect, openness, honesty and responsibility, and quality and teamwork. Over the coming months, we'll begin work with all of our health boards to ensure a similar values-based approach to the selection of their senior executive directors. Similarly, in, a, in an evolving health and care system, the processes and machinery of governance must also continue to change and evolve. Traditionally, corporate governance has focused on direction, control and the establishment of rules and procedures. In our NHS, we recognise that it's not enough and that we must respond quickly and robustly to emerging issues and, importantly, ensure that open and constructive engagement exists. For NHS Scotland, this involves an open and transparent approach to governance, including annual reviews that are held in public, board papers and minutes that are published, audits both internal and external, certificates of assurance submitted from boards to the Director General of Health and social care and the ladder of escalation providing a framework for intervention where there are concerns. This is underpinned by regular dialogue between the Scottish Government and NHS boards both on developing strategy and on emerging issues. This regular dialogue includes meetings between myself and the chairs of NHS boards as well as regular meetings between chief execs and Paul Gray and his directors. Similarly, senior officials also remain in close contact with a range of professional groups such as the Scottish Partnership Forum, medical directors and finance directors. I believe the mix of legislation and guidance that is in place along with the regular open and constructive dialogue we have with senior executive and non-executive uh, board members gives me sufficient assurance around the performance of NHS Scotland, but I'm certainly not complacent and as we seek to improve services and drive up quality, so must we develop and improve our corporate governance arrangements. The introduction in 2015 of the integration of health and social care changed our landscape forever. In 2016, the publication of the Health and Social Care Delivery Plan set out a vision for government and local health and care services to deliver better patient care and better population health, including greater regional cooperation. We continue to seek new ways to improve and strengthen our governance of the NHS, and we do this with our partners and in the light of best practice. 
So uh, we are building from a strong existing foundation of corporate governance in the NHS, but our intention is to continue to develop our approach in recognition of the vital role played by good governance. Finally, I welcome the work that the committee has undertaken around corporate governance and the survey that was commissioned from health board members. This provides a, a level of assurance around how board members perceive themselves and their role. Importantly, it provides further confirmation that the developments around corporate governance now underway are the right things to do. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That's very helpful. And clearly, we've had a wide-ranging inquiry, and we have a number of areas uh, we will want to raise questions on. Can I start, perhaps, with the area of staff governance, uh, with the replacement of the former uh, NHS staff survey with iMatters, and the expectation that that would be uh, uh, fully implemented by the end of 2017? And I think you would previously informed us that you expected this month to have a health and social care staff experience report published on the basis of that. Can you tell us about the publication of the health and social care staff experience report and what action you anticipate uh, will be taken as a result of the report's findings? Okay, so the National Health and Social Care Staff Experience Report covering the, the full results of iMatter and Dignity at Work will be published on uh, Friday the 2nd of March, which is this Friday. Um, the time scales for producing this report, I think, have, have been challenging, it's fair to say, given that this is the, the first report of its type and the complexities of the, the data gathering and the analysis uh, have, been, have been complex. Um, and the independent company that was contracted to undertake this work has been working very closely with officials to ensure the robustness and accuracy of the, the data the report will present. So I think it is probably right that it was it was got right, if you like, before publication, so taking a little bit more time to, to make sure uh, that was the case. Um, the iMatter staff experience continuous improvement model has been developed um, and provides a, a, a new mechanism for measuring employee engagement levels across all 22 health boards, so we're keen to make sure that there is a, a growing uh, participation uh, uh, in iMatter um, and, you know, I think if we want to get a bit more detail, Shirley, do you want to say yeah. a little bit more? Thank, thanks very much. Um, th so the committee will be aware that iMatter is a very different kind of tool than the staff survey, which was a, a paper-based set of correspondence with some tick boxes about how people were feeling. Uh, iMatter sits more closely along, alongside some of our OD initiatives and it allows teams and individuals to talk about the individual set of circumstances that they see in their part of the organisation and to um, develop their own plans for how they want to tackle some of those initiatives. Um, iMatter has given us a significantly larger return. So in 2017, the questionnaire achieved a 63% return response rate with 108,000 respondents out of 172,000 staff thereabouts, including 23, nearly 24,000 staff from 23 health and social care partnerships. So it's not something that is only to be used within the NHS. It has a wider reach into IGBs. That compares with previous staff survey completion rates that varied from 28 to 38 per cent over the preceding three attempts. So it's giving us a much larger sample size. It's giving us something quite different. Alongside of that, um, we ran the complementary Dignity at Work survey in November of last year and achieved a response rate of 36,000, uh, sorry, 36%, which is 63,000 respondents. So we anticipate having a um, very good platform to make conclusions about how it feels to work in health and social care across that piece and be able to encourage boards and support boards to be able to do whatever it is locally to improve those levels of engagement. Clearly, the, the publication on the 2nd of March is, is very close to your initial uh, intention of February and, and, and very welcome. Can, while I, clearly, you won't want to preempt the publication, but can you tell us um, a little bit about what responses uh, iMatters reflects? In other words, uh, you've talked about the level of participation, which is clearly uh, very welcome. What does it tell us about the standards of staff governance at an, uh, 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 in the individual boards and across the country? 
The first thing it tells us, which I think is really important, is that staff governance is taken very seriously. So the, um, the um, particular pleasure that I've had is, is in seeing the way in which the staff side have contributed to that and the importance that the staff side have placed on iMatter and that analysis from, from the boards. It tells us an awful lot about the pride and engagement that people feel working in health and social care. It also talks to us a little bit about some of the challenges that, that sometimes are, are, arise from, from the, the experiences of working in health and social care. So, so it gives us that richness. But if I can, if I can say that f for me, uh, perhaps I can um, make reference to a, a quote here from the RCN, which said, health trade unions as well as employers and the Scottish Government are committed to implementing the new approach in 2017, ensuring that staff concerns are better recorded and listened to. It's simply not the case that NHS staff are being silenced. Rather, staff representatives have worked in partnership with employees and Scottish Government to strengthen the process by which staff can have their say. I think it actually emerged, did it not, out of the Scottish Workforce and Staff Governance Committee as a concept in the first place, so it was very much driven by staff side, which is positive. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, I wonder if I can turn to Emma Harper. Uh, Thank you, Convener. Good morning, everybody. I'm interested in aspects around whistleblowing, and uh, the information we have is that you know the committee took evidence previously about whistleblowing and some of the items expressed or concerns expressed were around the independence of whistleblowing investigations, allegations of mistreatment of whistleblowers and the independence of whistleblowing champions as non-executive directors of a board. So I'd like to ask the Cabinet Secretary and the panel to tell us a little bit more about the role of whistleblower um, like the investigation part, and I'd like to ask your view, Cabinet Secretary, on how the Scottish Government will assess the effectiveness of the new role, and then what changes would you expect to see yeah, around that? Because of the non-executive whistleblowing yes, champions. Yes. Um, so the non-exec whistleblowing champions have been in place in each board since 2015, and boards have allocated the role to existing non-executive directors. Um, and it was really intended to provide a level of local scrutiny and assurance independent of the direct management or handling of whistleblowing concerns. So it was a go-to person that was separate uh, from potentially someone's line manager, for example. So it was seen to be somebody who, who would be a go-to person, but also someone who could promote and champion whistleblowing uh, as, a, as a concept in its, its own right. So... Um, each board also has a designated and trained named contact outlined in their whistleblowing policy who staff may contact directly for advice and to raise concerns out with line management. Uh, and um, I guess the whistleblowing champions are also there to ensure that internal mechanisms uh, within boards are working effectively in line with whistleblowing policy and to support staff in raising concerns. Training has been provided and guidance has been developed to support the, the champions in their role um, and of course some of the whistleblowing champions may themselves have been whistleblowers previously um, in terms of their interest uh, in the role. Um, I think the benefits of the role are, um, are uh, emerging. Um, so um, in one of the, the boards the whistleblowing champion challenged the way in which the board gathered information about the number and nature of whistleblowing cases and that led to a piece of work being undertaken across the whole of the NHS to ensure that information is gathered and recorded consistently and those templates were then piloted in four boards and they're going to be rolled out following partnership agreement later in the year. Um, there are other examples as well of, of, um, uh, of, of good um, benefits flowing from the role that we can, we can certainly furnish the committee with if you'd find that helpful. Um, there'll be a continuous ongoing review of the process and then updates and the evolution of the role as items are I guess exposed. Yes, um, absolutely. Um, I mean, the, there there have been stakeholder uh, events which are important in terms of getting that that feedback, um, and those have raised some important issues around training, implementation, and communication. And we're going to reflect on on these issues as the policy develops further. Um, also, the um, 
we need to look at the role of whistleblowing champions and the relationship they are going to have with the uh, independent national uh, whistleblowing uh, officer. Uh, the INWO and the support available for whistleblowers at local and national level. So as that landscape develops with that national officer, um, I think that it's important to look at the, the development of and the relationship with the local champion. So it's an, an evolution. Um, but I think it's a, a important and, and has, I think, so far demonstrated it, its, its worth. Thank you. Thank you. Brief supplementary, Sandra White. Brief supplementary uh, in regard to the INWO, the international, you know, independent, uh, under the auspices of the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. It's going to be introduced this year sometime. Do we have a, a date for that? And what you said previously, um, Cab said, is you still have these um, whistleblowers, as you might call it, where you, people can go to them and then they will go to this new independent. So there's a, a three step there. Is that correct? So, so let me answer your first question. Um, the uh, legislation will be introduced uh, um, in the, the first part of, of this year um, uh, to allow the INWO role to be hosted within the SPSO um, and uh, with a view to the INWO being introduced late in late 2018. Okay. Um, and... Yeah. Is that secondary legislation that you anticipate? Yes, it's secondary legislation, yeah. yes. Um, you'll be pleased to hear. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, in terms of the relationship and roles, I mean, I think that's why it's important that we are clear and there's opportunities for further um, training and development of guidance around how does that role then relate to the local champions, and that's, I think, work that we, we need to develop. Shirley, do you want to...? Yeah, if I can just add to that, the decision to cite the Independent National Whistleblowing um, Champion Officer within SPS SPSO, far too many initials in all of those sentences, um, was, was taken after a fairly substantial bit of consultation and a proposal was developed which we're in the process of implementing. The arrangements by which people can raise whistleblowing concerns are, are many and, and designed to be many, so they can use the independent helpline or whatever. The other important thing about the, inter, uh, the independent national whistleblowing officer is that, that uh, in gathering information in an appropriately anonymized way will help the system to learn. And it's really important that, I mean, above, above anything else in our approach to around whistleblowing is to try and get the system to learn as a result of those concerns being raised. I can supplement um, and add to the Cabinet Secretary's examples if, if the committee would find that helpful, but we're already getting examples of practice that's been changed and relationships that have been changed as a result. On though to wider issues of workload and uh, human resourcing and Alison Johnson, I think. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning. Um, uh, we heard during the staff governance strand of our inquiry about the stress that some NHS employees are under currently, um, really from under-resourcing. There was a feeling that staff often work above and beyond their contracted hours um, from goodwill, um, but that can lead to burnout, which then uh, leads to sick leave and puts pressure on, on colleagues. Now, uh, a, a key tenant of the GP contract is that you know, primary care, as already happens, you know, will free up GPs to focus on, on certain tasks and others will, will carry out, you know, some of the tasks they're clearly carrying out already. But I'd just like to understand what work has been done with those other professions to realise this vision for primary care. So, um, I mean, first of all, I think we recognise that our staff in the NHS work very, very hard in all roles and, you know, many, yeah, they do go beyond the... Uh, the, the Call of Duty on many occasions and I think this winter has demonstrated where staff go the extra mile to keep patients safe and I, I absolutely pay tri tribute to each and every one of them um, and I think that's why you know when we're looking at um, uh, de the development of for example safe staffing uh, putting the workload tools on a statutory footing and looking at how we make sure that we can use those tools to good effect and where they've been tested so in for example Forth Valley they've actually shown a reduction in sickness absence because it's about having the the right staff, the, the right time and the right place and being able to flex the, the rotas to um, take account of uh, you know, high 
level of acuity of patients, people, patients with dementia and so on and so forth. So just as a, a, a general point, uh, I, I think that's important. In terms of the, the GP contract and the new model, um, obviously the negotiation was very much a, a, a bilateral negotiation between uh, the Scottish Government and the BMA to secure uh, the, the GP contract. But what's important in building that multidisciplinary team is the engagement of those other staff and that has certainly uh, been uh, picking up a pace, uh, particularly with, uh, with other organisations representing other staff to make sure that um, that that multidisciplinary model um, has the um, you know not just the support uh, of those other staff groups, but that the the way it's going to work in practice is is worked through. So there's been a lot of work, uh, particularly post contract agreement, to uh, to uh, expedite that in anticipation of of the changes that that are uh, going to take place. Um, so it has, I mean, I think you'll appreciate that when you have a bilateral agreement and then a vote on a contract, it's, you've got to vote on what the what's in the, the contract. And that has been quite tricky because uh, the delivery of the model will re rely and re require uh, those the engagement of those other staff groups. So it has been quite a, a complex thing to take forward. But um, I, I hope certainly that uh, that those other staff groups uh, feel they certainly yeah there's been a lot of effort put into engaging them. Can I just ask, are we confident that you know phase three of the workforce plan will look at this, and are we confident that those other groups have the capacity to be <coughs> as fully involved as we'd want them to be? Yep. So part three of the workforce plan, which is due to be published uh, imminently. Um, is going to be important to set out the, you know, it's not just about increasing the number of GPs, albeit we made a commitment to do that, and that's important. It's absolutely about growing those other elements of the workforce. Now, we've already made some very substantial announcements in that direction. So, for example, for nursing and midwifery, midwifery training posts, the commitment to 2,600 additional uh, training posts by uh, the but in the next uh, four, four years, by the end of this parliament, has been a big commitment. It's a big uplift in that core uh, workforce. And of course, m that's with a view to many of them working within the community as we shift the, the balance of care. That community nursing role, practice nurses, a uh, hugely important part of that multidisciplinary model. But as are AHPs, as are the, the mental health workers, and of course there's the commitment to the 800 additional um, uh, mental health uh, workers within uh, that uh, that uh, financial commitment and uh, commitment was given in the program for government. So it's about bringing all of that together and sh shifting the resources as well. I mean, the the, the resources going in in 2018-19 into to primary care and delivering the GP contract are substantial. I mean, 110 million pounds of additional investment is it, we've, is is a game changer, and that that commitment to uh, continue to invest in primary care will help to deliver the workforce that that we need to build but it's going to take time i mean i can't say like two weeks on tuesday we're going to have all those people in place it's going to take time to build that that work workforce and that's recognized in the way the gp contract is a is a is a build up if you like of that that model it's not going to happen overnight but it's a direction of travel that uh, we uh, have embarked upon that I think will deliver better patient care. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much. Did, I was looking at Charlie Rogers, who I think wanted to offer some additional... It was, it was really going back to your first question about how people are supported and just to, to, to um, advise the committee that there is a, a battery of resources available to the NHS workforce, of whom I'm a proud member, um, who involving occupational health support, staff support generally, welfare support and so on. We're working very closely with the colleges in respect of the way that um, we can support um, people in what, what are sometimes quite pressurised roles, as, as the committee will understand. We work very closely with the RCN. We have quite a programme of work at the moment looking at staff wellbeing because clearly 
the NHS and health and social care employ a lot of people. So if we can improve the, the well-being of our own staff, we're doing quite a lot to improve the well-being of the population. So there's a there's a battery of things that are available to, to NHS and other staff to help them and support them in, in that process. And the, the final point I wanted to pick up on was, was one that Cabinet Secretary has just touched on. The sustainability of, of the health service requires us to think ever more closely about multidisciplinary, multi-professional teams. So the importance in part three of the workforce plan around things like pharmacy services, the kind of support that's required for paramedicine, the kind of support that's required through the AHPs generally has allowed us to engage quite heavily in that space. And as the Cabinet Secretary has already said, Part three will obviously speak quite a lot about what we've found from the GP contract, but it won't speak only of that. It will talk about what that primary care team looks like and what it will continue to look more like as we go forward. It's, it's just to Alison's point about stress and burnout in staff. My next um, Chief Medical Officer's annual report, which will be published in mid-April, has a chapter on valuing our NHS healthcare staff. That's distributed to all doctors and nurses and AHPs in Scotland. So it will raise awareness of some of the support that Shirley has alluded to, but it also is, has a lot of information within it about the research that's been done about the impact on not only those staff, but on the care that they provide. And we know, for example, that staff who are under pressure may become very risk averse. And they actually don't make good decisions regarding risk. And that probably leads to over treatment and, and over investigation so that the staff's stress is actually having an impact on patient care. So, so I explore that in the report but I'm also doing that in order to raise awareness among those staff groups that actually they need to look after themselves and we have a duty to, to look after them. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Can we move on to clinical governance and start with uh, Brian Whittle. Good morning panel and I'm um, really interested in uh, sort of how we measure adverse events, what constitutes an adverse event, uh, because it, it, it's been explored quite a lot within uh, within this committee, uh, and there's been quite a lot of conflicting, uh, conflicting evidence from a number of people. Um, so I'm interested in what constitutes uh, an adverse event, what guidance is given, um, who monitors and who responds to uh, to changes in adverse events within, within the health board. I'll kick off and then maybe uh, Catherine, you want to, to come in. Mayor, his, as you know, is the lead organisation for adverse events. And back in 2012, we instructed uh, his to develop a, a national framework and a programme of reviews for adverse events. That national framework was published in September 2013 following extensive consultation. It was then refreshed in April 2015 to reflect changes in best practice and to ensure, ensure consistency of approach. Um, when changes in patterns or of incidents or concerns occur in an individual board, um, the adverse events adverse um, national adverse events framework is clear that boards should undertake trend analysis of adverse events data um, and as you'll be aware um, from the the experience in Ayrshire and Arran where um, there were concerns about the um, inconsistency of of, uh, of uh, the application of a significant uh, adverse event uh, review process that his um, have um, well his got have been involved in addressing that and are monitoring those matters on a, a quarterly basis, but also that Catherine, as the CMO, um, wrote to uh, boards to remind them of the need for consistency in terms of what um, what uh, constituted a significant uh, um, adverse event review and, and what should be handled in what way, because it is really important that boards are consistent in that. Catherine, do you want to... And I, th I think your, your point is, is well made that we have had inconsistency. Inconsistency in what's, what's reported, but also inconsistency in what our response has been. And very much, I know, Mr Whittling, you're, in, uh, you're very interested in the involvement of people who've been harmed or who have had these adverse events occur to them or their families. So, so for, for the first time, we are, we are attempting to bring these into a, a much more standardised form of 
not only reporting but also reacting to reports. And I know that you, you know very much about the mater national work in maternity services, where we have found that it's inconsistencies not only across Scotland but actually right across the, the UK. So we're, we're not alone in this being having been a problem in the past. But what, we, what we know is that we get a, a standardised report, but also that that involves families patients themselves, but also their families in, in having some of that feedback to them. If, if I could, uh, j j just to clarify then, so is it the responsibility of the board themselves to review their adverse event reviews, or, or is there, a, is there a, a, a level above that where the government are, have an overview of that? Because I think what's really important here is it's not measuring adverse events against mm -hmm. other, you know, we're not trying to penalise anybody here. What we're right. trying to do is, is, is create an environment where we can learn. And for me, adverse events or the significant adverse events gives us the opportunity to look at the system rather than the individual healthcare professional. So is there somewhere above the health board? I mean, if the health board are responsible for their own measurement of their own uh, adverse events, wh where, so, where does the government sit within that? Well, um, if when the, the work of, well, you have the boards obviously looking at their own um, uh, adverse events and looking at trend analysis so they should be looking whether there are trends uh, emerging then you have the his overview of that and where his identify a, a serious concern um, with um, a board um, uh, that so something has emerged from either that trend analysis or from his scrutiny work um, then um, his can escalate this to the board's accountable officer, uh, the, the chief exec chair, and to the Scottish government. Um, so if you look at, um, for example, an example of that back in August 2013, when the previous cabinet secretary um, commissioned his to undertake a rapid review of the, the safety and quality of care for acute adult patients in NHS Lanarkshire, that was prompted by a, a higher than predicted level of mortality in the first quarter of 2013, um, because obviously the, the measurement of the, the hospital standardised mortality ratio uh, gives us that uh, ability to, to, to measure. Um, the review report then made recommendations, including the need for stronger focus and leadership in implementing robust safety measures and in the redesign of services. Um, and the, the, the recommendations were aimed at senior managers to really make the improvements you're talking about. So I guess that's one example of an escalation because there was, it was identified, there was a trend, there was something not right. That was identified initially by NHS Lanarkshire themselves, but also by his. Uh, that was escalated to the Scottish Government. The Cabinet Secretary intervened and what flowed from that. So that's one example of where we would expect that to work. The duty of candour, obviously, which is coming into force from the 1st of April, I think provides another level of reassurance in that it, I guess it reminds everybody and, and by, by statute requires, places a legal duty on organisations and the individuals who provide uh, health and care services within those organisations to, um, uh, to report um, and publish annual reports on all incidents that have instigated the duty of candour procedure. So that will bring a, 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 an extra layer of, of transparency, I guess, in that, that, and not only reporting on the incident, but what action was then taken and the learning from that. So I think all of that amounts to a, a, a system that, you know, I've, I'm confident in is ro robust enough to pick up anything that needs to be picked up. And it's maybe just worth mentioning that um, this you might have seen the reporting on the um, the fact that um, the patient safety pro program has actually delivered and cut hospital mortality by over 10 percent across uh, the period meeting a key aim 15 months early and I think the patient safety program sits behind all of this as a way of making sure that where that learning isn't just learning for its own sake, but it improves patient safety. And there's evidence, I think, from that, that it has, over the 10 years of its operation, has led to a safer system. Things still happen, things still go wrong, but overall, I think it is a safer system than we had 10 years ago. The evidence, Cabinet Secretary, we've had from Health Improvement Scotland suggests that there isn't really a central recording of adverse events and there isn't really access for them to, to all of that information. Is that something you recognise or...? Uh, 
Well, I think the duty of candour will, because of all, all of the requirements for, for those reports to be published, the learning and the um, that's taken and the, the changes that would happen on the back of, of a report, for that to be published brings a, a public transparency and scrutiny to, to the public, no, not, not, just, not, not just the service. And I think that's an important development on the back of duty of candour. I mean, we always keep these things under review, but what, what's the most important thing here? And for me, it is that when something happens, there is an openness um, about that. And I think, well, there's... I don't know, there are concerns, obviously, with the Bauer Garba case, that um, although it was a, an English case, we've got to make sure that the message goes out um, and we want to look at how we we re-emphasise this with the duty of candour from the 1st of April, that the most important thing is openness and transparency around what has occurred. And that's really, really important because if we don't have that, we'll have people retreating and not being open and transparent and therefore the learning um, and improvement in patient safety opportunity will be lost. So it's really important that we re-emphasise that. And so the most important thing is the open tra openness and transparency, learning from the incident, that all of that is, is, op is clear and open and the reporting of that with the duty of candour, I think will we'll bring a transparency to that. Um, and hopefully address some of the criticisms that there's been uh, around whether boards are, are open and transparent enough with the information that flows. Obviously, patient confidentiality has to be protected, but you know there is a lot of information that can be placed in the, the public domain. The involvement and role of his um, beyond that provides that that uh, scrutiny that is required and the clear escalation process to Scottish Government in uh, cases where there is a trend and something sy systemic or systematic within a board, uh, it can be picked up on and acted upon. And I think we you know, uh, uh, used the, the case of NHS Lanarkshire, but also the fact that in the adverse event reporting itself in Ayrshire and Ireland, we've been quite quick to, I think, re get or get um, improvements happening within that particular board and the, the way they record. So um, we always, you know, if there are other things we can do, we'll obviously always keep those under review, but there are a lot of developments in this space, not least the duty of candour, that I think will add real uh, value to. Thanks. Can I ask a, a little more generally about uh, standards and variation in care? And I know the Chief Medical Officer has had some comments to make on that recently in, in, in public. And, and, and I guess the question is whether health professionals, and I'm looking more widely than at adverse events, but in general standards of care, do health professionals need more guidance or support in delivering a consistent standard of care? I think that we are beginning to understand the amount of variation there is, not only in practice, but in the outcomes of that practice. My first annual report pointed out variations across Scotland and in fact in, in speaking to audiences so this isn't just doctors it, it's it's uh, mixed healthcare professionals and and from social care too that I really challenge them to say do you do you know how your practice compares with the next unit over or the next care home or or the next health board and people aren't aware that there, there's variation in practice and variation in, in the uh, procedures we're doing to people the uh, there has been an awareness in England and an atlas of variation has been published for some years. And so for the first time in Scotland, we'll publish an atlas of variation this year. We're hoping to have that by the end of April and that will cover um, hip replacements, knee replacements and cataract surgery. And that will be done by um, population level, but also by health board so that we, we at the moment then probably flag up more questions than answers. So I, I personally don't know what the correct rate of hip replacements is, but I do know that it shouldn't vary in a country like Scotland uh, with one rate in one part of the country and, and three or four times the rate in a different part of the country. So the, that the next part of this is then how to interrogate those data and how do we then examine whether some parts of the country there are too few procedures being done and arguably are we doing too much in other parts. So we start with those three operative procedures. Those, those are chosen because they're very common 
and they're done all across Scotland in all of our areas. And we will then build on that year on year. So we plan to add pub <coughs> public health measures, um, childhood obesity, again, it may surprise you to hear, varies across Scotland um, from less than 20% in some parts of Scotland to over a third in other parts of Scotland. And uh, uh, the, the parts of Scotland that are the highest may not be where you would expect. It isn't inner city Glasgow, it's Stumfries and Galloway and NHS Shetland. So again, we need to understand that, first of all. I, I can give you the, those data, but we need to then explore with those individual areas. And, and this brings us back to the importance of local data for local interpretation. It, it, and, and sometimes the, the government's top-down approach will not, that will not help because local areas know their own issues and also are, are the right people to solve those. We, so we're determined to tackle variation because what I can't tolerate is that, it, it, that, that there are differing patient outcomes across a small country with a, a population of 5.4 million. Clearly a very important step. Can I ask uh, how the evidence from that, and you, you've identified the three disciplines that will be examined first, how the evidence of that will feed into priority setting uh, either through his or from the government directly to boards? Well, it fits very well with the elective collaborative that has been led by Professor Derek Bell because that is very much about um, identifying best practice, um, identifying kind of wicked problems, if you like, and then being able to work with the, 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 the best brains uh, ar ar around and expertise uh, around uh, those issues and to then roll out the, the best practice. So if you look at for example, some of the, the work done around orthopaedics in Glasgow, uh, GRI particularly, with the, the virtual clinics. So it's one example in one uh, specialty where they have been doing groundbreaking work. Uh, and some of that will help to address the variation, but also to um, create um, the, the best, most effective and efficient use of resources and you know the twin track we're taking of investment and reform go together because if we can get the reform bit right we can make sure that every pound spent is being spent in the most efficient way delivering the best outcomes and and it's unwarranted variation we're trying to tackle here there will be some variation that's very acceptable because a rural you know very remote and rural uh, um, Scotland you know there may well be variation that's that's warranted but what we're talking about is unwarranted variation where there's really no reason other than the way things are done that there are diff varying different uh, outputs and outcomes so you know there is we're really we think that, that there is a lot of scope here um, in, in, a, in elective care particularly to to make uh, big big inroads and on the public health side as well and of course uh, this afternoon there's a an opportunity to, to explore some of the issues around uh, taking forward uh, public health policy in the area of of, uh, of diet and obesity and and I think we we can uh, look at some really um, exciting preventative work there's a lot of work going on in type 1 diabetes for example uh, that we're we're testing out with the results of which are uh, on the pilot have been very very exciting indeed of being able to actually through um, through a, a, a management of the patient being able to avoid type 1 uh, diabetes which is very uh, or type 2 diabetes, I should say, um, is very, very exciting indeed. And we could share that information with the committee. Of, but I'm, I'm, the, um, I saw a presentation at the chair's meeting uh, about some of the early results and you know the, the percentages of, of those patients with type 2 di diabetes that were uh, being turned around, if you like. It's not a technical term, but um, you know what I mean. Um, and through, through exercise and diet was very exciting indeed. So those are the types of ideas we want to take um, and, and roll out. Excellent. Thank you very much. I have a number of colleagues who wish to ask about scrutiny of NHS boards, and I'll start with David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Convener. If I can move on, as the Convener said, to scrutiny of NHS boards, uh, the panel will know that we've had a number of written submissions which have suggested that there should be the creation of an independent regulator of the NHS in Scotland. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary and her colleagues uh, whether they agree with that submission? 
So we have uh, had this debate on a number of occasions and, you know, really, I guess I asked myself the, the, this question, what, what is it we look for in terms of the, um, the performance and scrutiny and safety of our services? And the reason that Healthcare Improvement Scotland was developed in the way that it was, was to have a dual function. So we could have set it up as sitting over there um, inspecting, but if it didn't have an improvement arm, then you leave the organisation with a set of problems without a set of solutions to go with it. And the reason that Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and the answer is in the title, has you know a focus on improvement is to, yes, through their inspection, uh, and they don't, you know, if anybody's read any of the, his reports, I think it would be hard to argue that they pull their punches in any way. And, you know, the times I've had to go in front of a camera and talk about, you know, X, his report on a particular service, they don't pull their punches. They're very robust reports. Um, and of course, we have the healthcare environment inspectorate within that, focusing very much on the uh, you know issues of cleanliness and infection control. So they identify out of their inspections the set of issues to be resolved, and then they work with that organisation on their improvement plan. And I think from a patient safety point of view, that dual approach for me is a better way to proceed because it then helps the organisation concern whatever board it is to do something about the issues that have been identified. So, um, you know, I for me, that is the critical point. Now, in terms of the, the work that HIS does with others, it has an, a memorandum of understanding, for example, with the health and safety executive. So if there are issues around health and safety, there is a clear relationship there uh, um, and uh, it can be um, assured that the, the right issues will be dealt with by the right organisation if that's the nature of the issue that's being looked at. So, you know, I, I believe very strongly that uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland has worked well in improving patient safety. I think we've 10 years down the line of the patient safety programme is testament that we have a safer system. And I think it's because of that dual role uh, that his has of inspection, but also of improvement that has helped to deliver that. I'd certainly be so you convener that um, Healthcare Improvement Scotland's done an excellent job in terms uh, of best practice. I think the IHUB, which uh, we referred to a few months ago, and particularly work around diabetes, is really first class. But I could refer the Cabinet Secretary to the recent report by the OECD and what they say, and I'm quoting here, the mix of roles between scrutiny and quality improvement, I'm quoting this bit, the mix of these roles means that the systems inspector risks marking its own homework. What's the Cabinet Secretary's view in the OECD report? About this. Well, I guess, and I, I understand the OECD's uh, report. I've read that 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 bit of the report, uh, and I guess the answer to that is the nature of the reports themselves. If there was a an idea of it was all cosy, cosy, and you know his um, were doing these kind of rosy reports of uh, of um, services that they go in to inspect, and all was fine. But that's actually not the case. As I said earlier, uh, his do not pull their punches. Those reports are very robust. They um, have exposed some very difficult issues uh, on the and in some of those reports. And you know the. Um, they provide uh, a lot of, of public um, public scrutiny and uh, those reports are in the public domain. I get, I read them. Um, the action taken by his with the organisation to address and then of course they go back to check that what the board said they were going to do about that particular service has indeed been done and of course the government engages with the board so I've had a number of phone calls directly with the chair of said board about a report to say what are you going to do about that and then I follow that up so you can be assured that you know there's no kind of softly softly around these reports they are robust in nature but they have a, an important improvement element so that when his go back there is a, an assurance there that the um that what they were to do and the shortcomings that were to be addressed have indeed been addressed well, 
excerpt earlier through your convenience, I mean, I think his does an excellent job, particularly in its quality improvement. I mean, has the government looked at responding to OECD report by separating out the functions, keeping the quality improvement and the basis of ain't broke, why fix it, but perhaps having an independent scrutiny function? I think that would be really difficult to do within his because there, if you if you have um, if you separated out those functions, essentially you would not have the strength that I think his has of identifying the problem, but then supporting the organisation to address the problem. If you had that separated out, then um, those two things would not sit together. And I think the strength of his is the fact they do sit together. I should also say, though, that they bring in external uh, people. His don't just, it's not just a group of people that sit within his and they say, all right, who's going to pick up this report? They bring in people from outside uh, uh, his, they bring in that external expertise quite often from out with Scotland to take part in particular reports. So the the idea that there's not that external scrutiny is is not is not the case. There is, and you know, it's not worth the professional reputation of of those individuals who come in and do work on behalf of his to compromise that in any way. And and you can see from the reports that they absolutely do not. These are reports that do not pull their punches, and uh, those that external expertise is brought to bear in the full light of the, the public reports that are then made. But the important bit that happens after that is the improvements that take place and then the checking that those improvements have taken place. So I think we have a, a system that, uh, that, that works to constantly improve and continually improve uh, the, the service here in Scotland. And that, from a patient safety perspective, is actually very, very important. Okay. Very much. Um, Ivan McKee. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, convener. Thank you, um, Cabinet Secretary and officials for coming along to talk to us well, now this afternoon. Um, I was going to talk about board scrutiny, um, but just before I go into that, in terms of the review process, but just before I go into that, I just wanted to comment on that uh, conversation about HIS, and I'm, I'm glad to see that there is a grown-up approach to contents improvement processes, because certainly in my experience, um, it's very important that both of those roles are combined and you understand what the problem is and then go on to fix the, the solution and drive the improvement processes um, using the, th 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 through the, that same methodology rather than splitting the two up, which would be much, much less effective. Um, in terms of um, specifically on board reviews, I suppose I just want to drill into um, how those happen, how often they are, how effective you think they are, um, in terms of holding boards to account for their performance um, and if you think that process is, is set up to be as effective as it could be? So um, boards have uh, annual reviews which are uh, open to, to the public um, and ministers are involved in every two years, I think, is it? By la yeah, by annual, yeah. In there. Um, so, board, if, so I've chaired numerous board reviews um, and then the following year it would be an uh, official from the Scottish Government that would, would, would uh, chair it. Um, and the opportunity there is to look back on what the board has done um, for that previous year and to ask questions about that in a public domain and then to look forward to the following year in terms of their plans. Um, and it's an opportunity for me and the ones that I've done and other ministers as well to uh, drill down and to meet with, so, so for example, part of the, the board review, um, I would meet with the area partnership forum, meeting with the staff side and having a kind of full and frank discussion with them, also with the clinical community, uh, with patients who receive the services. And again, it's an opportunity to hear from from uh, from them what they think. And, you know, it's, a, you know, they, they, again, they don't pull their punches, some very positive responses, but sometimes very challenging as well. Um, and then after the public session, there is a, a drilling down further uh, in a private session with, with the board around some of the, the detail. And uh, Christine and others will look at financial aspects, for example. And Christine gets in and about some of the financial plans. And uh, so it is an opportunity, if you like, to for the board to showcase some of the work it's doing, but also for us to hold them to account. Okay. It's obviously quite a, a lengthy time between reviews. Mm -hmm. What kind of review process goes on 
on a kind of monthly, weekly, quarterly yep. basis. So um, the senior management team, and Christine can say a little bit about this, uh, work on going with boards. I mean, uh, you know, every, every week um, there will be uh, some kind of, of contact with boards. And if there are issues and concerns, that will be very frequent. Uh, I also meet with, I, uh, meet with the chairs um, on a monthly uh, basis to um, discuss with them particular issues. So I'll make them aware of things that are coming up, for example. They'll raise issues with me of a kind of strategic nature and we'll have a, a good discussion about those. Uh, Paul Gray meets um, um, monthly as well with the, the chief executives uh, and there will be more operational issues discussed at that. So I think it's fair to say that the engagement between the Scottish Government and the, the boards, um, particularly their senior management teams, is, is very... Um, regular and very close and so it should be because it's important that we know if there are issues uh, within boards and likewise uh, that they alert us if there are any issues. So I think a number of the conversations recently are, are about individual components of a wider system of, of assurance that, that we operate so none of these things even though a, a his report um, any particular single instance is, is part of the wider assurance system and we try to join up all those different components when we look at the, the overall performance of a board and the management of risks. Um, so, for instance, as, as well as those um, planned meetings, there are also mid-year reviews with all of the boards that are held with officials um, in NHS boards and with Scottish Government. Um, and there, if if they're deemed to be a higher level of, of risk within particular boards, then we, we may have more frequent formal meetings with boards of... Um, quarterly or bi-monthly or whatever the need is with a very specific set of, of actions to take forward. Also things like governance statements that come through from boards as part of their, their audit process with external audit scrutiny and assurance on that. So we, we take all of these components into consideration along with um, it, if there are particular levels of risks and boards. We, look, we have a, a, a case management approach where we look at staff clinical issues along with issues of performance, issues of finance, to bring them all together um, to take a more rounded view of the performance of that board. So the, I think the annual review is a, is a much more um, public um, part of that overall piece of, of performance and assurance, but it is only one component, and the success of it, I think, is based on the success of everything you do on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis with the system. Right, that's clear. That's great. Thanks very much. Thank you. <coughs> Miles Briggs. Thank you. Uh, convener and good afternoon to the, the panel. Um, I wanted to look specifically around culture within governance because I think that's something which for uh, all the work we've been doing on this keeps coming back to us um, from people who've given evidence and I don't know if the panel's had a chance to look at the um, research which was conducted for the committee by SPICE um, with um, over half of the health board members and specifically with regards to government's uh, role within health boards. One said that the level of political interference in NHS health boards was excessive and negative while others said that it spent too long firefighting rather than planning ahead and specifically one, some board members also complained that they'd had little control over their strategic direction as the Scottish Government was so dominant in the delivery of health care. So I just wondered, how would you respond to these points which, was put, which were put to the committee and do you recognise these concerns in terms of planning and governance? Um, so um, let me first of all say that you know, we should always take these uh, issues very seriously, but overall I thought the feedback was actually very positive. Um, and you've highlighted uh, a few uh, issues there, but overall the, the feedback was very positive. I mean, it's interesting because, um, and it's this balance, isn't it, of local and national. Um, I mean, if I had a pound for every time a member of the the Parliament has asked me to uh, intervene, to knock heads together, to tell a chair to get a particular board issue sorted. I would be a very rich woman indeed. So, you know, sometimes it's about, you know, you should do this and you should intervene and you should get a grip. And, you, and then other times it's like political interference, you should let there. So there is a balance to be struck. And I'm sure members around this table and in Parliament would not expect the Cabinet Secretary for Health to sit back and say, you know, you know, do whatever you 
you want. There is a, a strategic direction for the health service. We expect patients to be able to expect a con kind of consistent level of, of care. And we talked about that earlier on about the variation. Uh, and therefore, the, you know, without a kind of national a strategic direction, I, I think we would um, be failing in our duty to deliver that. However, the flip side of that is we, of course, expect boards, uh, particularly with their partners through their IGBs, to be uh, interrogating their own data, coming up with local solutions. Um, and it's just about getting the right balance. In terms of political interference as well, I mean, that, that could be levied as much at, you know, opposition politicians in a, a local setting as it could be against government ministers. And I have had a number of, of particularly non-execs say to me that actually uh, sometimes when it comes to making changes and service changes, that actually um, the political resistance to that from, from local members can be very, very difficult. So I'm not sure they had necessarily just government ministers in mind when they maybe made that remark. And I think really for us as politicians, it is about getting the balance right of making sure that there is accountability. And as the Cabinet Secretary for Health, I'm ultimately accountable um, and take that very, very seriously. And therefore, I need to assure myself that, uh, you know, our services are, you know, carrying out um, and the boards are carrying out their duties in a way that is consistent with what we would expect. On the other hand, we also need to allow boards to take forward um, uh, decisions um, in a way that there's clear guidance around. And, and that is sometimes a, a difficult balance to be struck, and it always will be. And you know, sometimes we get it right, and sometimes maybe we don't. Um, you know, to go to go back to the point which the chief medical officer said re regard, with regards to the atlas of variation, or I think what everyone sort of knows as postcode lottery across Scotland, how we can then look at um, how that is shared. And actually, I think that's one thing which our inquiries have shown that often when health boards are getting things right, they're not necessarily sharing across the country their best practice. I think that's where really, if we can make an impact in terms of governance, trying to make that really at the heart of our health service in Scotland. And like the chief medical officer said, you know, a country of 5.4 million people, surely we can get that best practice across the health boards. And I think that's really where, in terms of the political leadership, which is at the heart of that, um, I wanted to... Uh, pursue to see how you then see that developing because it's quite clear that it's not worked to date in making sure that happens. Um, I think it has worked in, in some ways if you look at the patient safety programme that's now 10 years old and when I go around uh, speaking to clinicians and we I did uh, just this last week to hear about the, the development over those 10 years of the patient safety programme you would not go into a care or health, a health setting now and for them not to have implemented the patient safety programme and best practice. So we have a safer service because people have taken the evidence from the patient safety programme and applied it. And some of the work I was looking at at the Western around um, the way that they have you know, developed that programme to um, reduce harm, save lives, and um, has really engaged the clinical community because they see the, the benefits of it. So I think that's a good example of that happening everywhere. But there's, there's more work to be done in terms of addressing variation. And I think we're moved away from the kind of not invented here syndrome. There's a lot more regional working going on. So uh, we've seen the, the, the emerging um, priorities of the, the North, East, uh, East and West around uh, what they're collectively going to do to um, not just share best practice, but to share services, to uh, to look at doing things differently in order to be more efficient, but also to de deliver uh, better patient care. So we, I think we're seeing a, 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 a picking up of the pace of that, uh, which is important. And the work that Catherine's doing around the Atlas of Variation will bring a rigour and scrutiny to the data that we then expect boards and their partners to not just scrutinise, but then do something about. So we've, I think over the next few years, you'll see far less unwarranted variation and far more efficiency in the way that things are done and technological advances will help that as well there's no excuse to not doing something if it's evidentially working um I, there would need to be a pretty good excuse for not doing it thank you very much alex Colham. thank you
Good morning to the panel. Thanks for coming to see us today. Um, my line of questioning is about public confidence, and in particular, as I asked the last <coughs> panel, it's around um, expectation management, and that is something that we can uh, do something about at a national level through government policy, but that's really also the preserve of the implementation by uh, NHS boards. And this speaks very much to, I think, Dr. Calderwood's thesis on realistic medicine and everything you've told us about realistic medicine this morning, that when credited with the facts about their situation, um, the public will be far more understanding than, than perhaps clinicians might expect and may make more mature decisions and decisions that might not be expected of them in the first place. Now, I have lost count of the number of times that um, in my surgeries I've been uh, visited by constituents who've had um, already long delays in treatment or waits for treatment extended still further beyond significantly beyond what they were originally told to expect now that happens a great deal and I'm sure it varies from board to board but can the panel tell us how we can do better at expectation management around waiting times because I think in a lot of these cases had my constituents been told that this is what you can be prepared to wait they would have accepted it, it would have been uncomfortable but it wouldn't have been as demoralising as then halfway through that wait being told they would have to wait the same again still further. So first of all let me say that improving access in, in all its dimensions is, is important um, so if you take, and I'll come back to waiting times in a second, but if you look at um, in primary care, the whole reason for developing the multidisciplinary team is to improve patient access and patient care. So, uh, and that is about expectation management and to the extent that the flip side of that is that you might not always see a doctor, but you'll see a, the right health professional uh, or care professional uh, to meet your needs. So you'll bet quicker access to that team, but it might not always be a doctor. So I guess that is a good example of that discussion with the public and the Alliance are doing a lot of work in engaging the public around, well, what does that mean for me? And actually it's quite interesting. I sat in in a session that actually people are very open to that because they want, the, the, they don't actually care what, what label the, the health professional or care professional has, as long as they can deal with their problem and do it in a, a speedy uh, manner that, that is, is easy to access. Um, in terms of uh, waiting times, we do have a challenge with waiting times, I absolutely accept that, and we're doing a lot of work, not just in investment, but in reform as well. Uh, so the work that uh, Pro Professor Derek Bell is carrying out around elective uh, reform is absolutely about improving um, and, and reducing uh, the, the time people have to wait by making better use of the resources we have and the, the investment that is going in is helping to transform the way we deliver things so that people can uh, get more, uh, can get quicker access to, to the treatment they need. And within that, there will always be a, a level of clinical prioritisation. So for urgent cases, um, we're, we've got a big focus on, on cancer pathways at the moment to make sure sure that, that people are getting more rapid uh, access through diagnostics uh, into uh, to treatment and uh, so there's a big focus on that. So it is going to take time given the demands on a service. I mean we, if you look at the growth in demand for outpatient appointments and for treatment, for procedures, we have a, a huge growth over the last 10 years. We have an ageing population so it's no surprise there. So just finally on building capacity with the five additional elective centres work progresses on those to make sure that we do have the capacity for the growing demand for, for knees, for hips, for, for, for uh, ophthalmology. Um, and that is like chasing an ever moving target, to be blunt, because it is, you know, we're increasing uh, um, capacity, but demand is also increasing and trying to get that into balance is quite a, a difficult thing to do. So yes, there is a, you know, a discussion with the public about what they can expect. The work on the modern outpatient um, uh, program is to, for example, avoid the default being that a GP just refers everybody to an outpatient appointment when actually other um, outcomes might be better for that patient. And that's very much the realistic medicine uh, territory that Catherine spoke about earlier on. Thank you very much. Can we move on now to Jenny Gregory? Good afternoon, rather, to the panel. Um, in terms of board uh, diversity, um, 
you'll have heard from the previous evidence session, uh, at the moment our board membership from the responses we had tends to be comprised of those over 55. Um, we don't have from the, the boards that responded to us anybody who's sitting on a, a board um, who's in the 18 to 24 age bracket. And in Inclusion Scotland also flagged up last week the issue of disability in terms of how you get those with disabilities onto boards and having a meaningful contribution to that process. Um, does the panel therefore have any views with regard to how we can get more people involved in the board process itself? Do you recognise that there are problems? I know Cabinet Secretary, you spoke about the gender representation on public boards legislation in your opening statement. And I wondered if the government had considered perhaps looking at an advertising campaign which targets certain groups uh, and therefore makes it more, I suppose, accessible to them than it currently is. Yes, um, a lot of work has gone on to, to try to... Um, recruit a more uh, diverse group of people um, and we can talk about some of the examples. I think we should recognise progress has been made though. If you look back over the last uh, few years, um, at the moment we have for all appointees, we have 48.8% women, uh, which is a big um, uh, increase from where we were. But you're right to point out that for for younger people, for people from an ethnic minority background, for people with disabilities, and, and so on, we have still under-representation. Um, and I think part of what I touched on in my opening remarks was that um, we have to broaden out, first of all, how the, the positions are, are advertised, um, and also the skills and experience that are required, so being... It's not just skills and experience are important. You also have to be able to do the, the, the job and that go, that's a given. But um, that we also need to look at that wider range of, um, of experience and uh, what someone would bring uh, to the board. So there's been huge attempts uh, to do that and that work is ongoing to try to make sure that we're not missing the opportunity to recruit. Um, Shirley, you want to give a couple of details? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to try and respond in, with a few examples around that and perhaps touch on some of the questions from Mr Briggs too in terms of the culture of boards and how we share experience. Because, because you're right that a board will be more effective if it represents the demographic of the people that it serves. And there, is, there are some challenges in that and the construct of part-time non-executive positions and what is quite a challenging role to hold boards to account for complex systems of governance and complex systems of procedures. But that shouldn't prevent us from making some significant efforts. And the kind of efforts that I'll point to are around things like using social media campaigns rather than print media in the sort of traditional thing, revising the application form process, working quite closely with the um, Office of the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life, obviously, to try and make sure that that's right, but revising the application form to make it less onerous, less experientially based for, to attract younger people. Um, to try and reconfigure, we've got examples now across a number of boards reconfiguring the interview process to make that less formal, to try and use people's um, judgments and values rather than necessarily a long track record of experience, which obviously plays to a different market. Um, we've done two other things that might be of quite useful importance in respect of the specifics of, of, of diversity on the board. One has been to look to have sort of open sessions. For example, we had a, an outreach event in Mary Hill Community Halls, and as a result of that outreach event, attracted approximately 190 applications from a variety of different people. It wasn't just, you know, a standard small advert in the back of a paper somewhere. The other thing that we've been doing, which I think is really important, is where we have the opportunity to recruit a number of board members at the same time. We've pre-designated some of those posts as development posts so that we can take into account bringing people who perhaps not had experience in that space and then linking the the two the two questions that with mr briggs questions it's really important that we understand the the breadth and importance of the role of non-executives and their role which is not necessarily as evident just from saying i'm a non-exec so we've produced in very easy to read terms, a series of support materials entitled what do non-executives need to know. So there's no great confusion to the language or whatever. There are eight of them at the moment and, and, and I, I wanted to play particularly to five 
that help to answer the question about share and sharing of best practice, and they relate to quality, efficiency and value, quality improvement and measurement, innovation, person-centred care, and improvement-focused governance. And just for completeness, the others relate to health inequalities, induction, so that people really understand the basics of governance, and then personal effectiveness. So there's a battery of materials now available, apart from all of the board development and induction and training programmes that take place. There's a battery of materials written as simply as it's possible to be, without you know, spoiling the story in that space, but as simply as it's possible to talk about the role of a non-executive in both holding the system to account and sharing that practice. I'm very conscious of time and with two other areas we need to cover very quickly. Um, I would uh, like to ask Sandra White if she would comment on a question on... Uh, th thank you, Kavina. The, the rare issues I wanted to raise in that particular one as well, I think Jenny Carruth did also, particularly how it affects people who are on benefits. Perhaps we could write to, to the yeah. cab sec on that one, if that would be right. Thank you very much, because there's a number of issues in that particular one. Uh, I wanted to talk about, or, or as quick as possible, on the governance of the IGBs. Uh, we heard from the previous panel that that's the proper way to go, you know, from the bottom up, as has already been said by uh, Dr Calderwood also. But there are difficulties in the cultural situation there. Uh, and obviously we'd heard from Audit Scotland in 2015. Just want to know if in an update is actually is it working better the IGBs and some of the issues that were read about potential conflict of interest with board members, you know, sitting in both boards, chief officers, local authorities, that type of thing. Should we actually in fact one uh, respondent mentioned the fact that we should perhaps look at the review of IGB uh, basically uh, government's arrangements. So I just wanted two quick questions. Have things improved since the report from uh, Audit Scotland in twenty fifteen and should we be looking at a different approach to the IGBs? So in the interest of time, um, obviously a lot of work's going on since the Audit Scotland report. I'll ask Christine just to briefly <coughs> respond. Okay, so I think probably the most important thing is that you, you, I hope you're aware that Audit Scotland are doing the second report and the work is underway in that, and that is due to report in November of this year. So that will give you a, um, a, a more independent assessment of that. And I think that that is... Everyone's um, very aware of that and looking at that as being a bit of a, a milestone and looking at, at the progress. But but certainly, the, the you know, if the purpose here was to bring um, parties together you know, in, in joint working, then it certainly achieved achieved that. The, the governance is, is a, a different set of governance than we've had previously. But I think, again, you know, one of the examples of looking over the Christmas period and how mm -hmm. partnerships worked showed that... Governance didn't uh, didn't either um, certainly didn't hinder that um, ability to work well, and lots of good examples of where um, partnerships working with the acute service and the ambulance service worked worked really well. And and I think some of those anecdotes are things that give you the evidence on the ground that these things are working, and that um, governance uh, working in a different way didn't stop any of that happening. A lot of the governance is about looking at having a, a three-year commissioning plan as much as it is about the day-to-day the -day operation. So I, I think there's a lot of um, a lot for us to, to, to build on. There are um, the, the way in which governance is operating is different and we need to make sure that people understand the, the differences and feel comfortable and that where it, there's a sense of a conflict that we take action to ensure that that's not the case. But I think I'm relatively confident that we can see the, the, the signs of progress there. But I think we'll look to the Audit Scotland report to give us all that um, clarity and the independent assessment. Thank you very much. And finally, Ash Denner. Thank you, Convener. I just wanted to touch briefly on the regional planning boards and the situation there with regard to governance. And you'll know that that has come up um, through the inquiry that we've done. So is there a framework for governance at that regional level? Or are they, I guess, is their role more to act as a sort of a coordinating structure? So I'll let, again, in the interest of time, Shirley, do you want to respond? You've been most involved with the regional plan. Yeah, the, the, the introduction of regional collaborative planning and delivery has not taken away the governance structures that previously existed. So boards in Tayside are still responsible for Tayside, board in Highland is still responsible for Highland. What the, what the regional structures are doing are planning those services that can best cooperate with each other to deliver a better service for patients 
on a regional basis. So there are actually a number of tiers. There's a, the national delivery plan, which you'll be aware of, that has the national boards providing certain of those solutions too. So the national boards focusing around things like digital platforms and that kind of thing. There's a regional tier that is at the moment um, in the process of planning to come forward with a series of proposals that we will give consideration to in due course on things that could be delivered in a slightly different way. Um, some of that harks to the point that Mr Briggs was making about variation and trying to establish best practice that is delivered across a region rather than just board by board. But it hasn't taken away the governance structures that existed beforehand. So the board remains accountable for the services delivered in its patch. And, and we'll see what comes forward as part of the delivery plan. Um, the expectation is that regional and national plans will be submitted for our consideration towards the end of March. It will then take us some time. If there are things in those plans that require us or require the service to go into consultation around future arrangements, then the consultation arrangements for those changes to service have not changed either. Thank you very much. And can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and her colleagues for a very helpful session. Clearly, governance of the NHS is something on which committee members would uh, cheerfully interrogate you all day. Um, but uh, it's been very helpful to have such uh, well-focused responses. I know you have offered us, Cabinet Secretary, some further information. I think you particularly highlighted preventative matters around diabetes interventions. Uh, Shirley Rogers talked about some examples of the impact of whistleblowers. Uh, and uh, uh, Sandra White's suggesting that the evidence we heard in her last session uh, about the impact of appointment to a health board on somebody on benefits and what that might do as a disincentive would be very useful to have your views on that as well. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. We'll now move into private session. <coughs>